Welcome to the show, everyone. Just waiting for the stream to catch up. Sometimes it likes to happen immediately. Other times it tends to take its time. Let's see. I think we're up. Welcome, everyone, to the show. Great to have you all here. And there's so many already in the comments. Let's say hi. Let me know if you can hear me by just commenting one, as it is. Raymond, welcome. Justin Bailey, Forbin, Jimmy, Reed, Second Hour Watchers, Forbin Colossus, Javier, Mark P., Pilot Style, Ashmore, Chili Badger, Steve, fantastic, Turkey Vulture. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining. And you can hear me. That's superb. This is going to be a great evening tonight or morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome. We're going to be talking about Rolex design in a bit more detail. The thinking was it would make an awesome video, but it might make a bit more sense with that community discussion at the same time. I had an idea of making this some kind of archived video for the new time Rolex purchaser or the person who is influenced by the brand and wants to get into more detail and learn a little bit more. So the thinking was to focus on Rolex design solely and discuss that in more detail, really cover a broad spectrum of Rolex related subjects. Because over the next few weeks, I probably won't be discussing Rolex for a while. There's a whole lot of videos that have been prepared already. And uh, this will be a time when we can spend a good few hours running through all of these references and just getting, you know, going Rolex mad. So just saying hi to everyone else. There's so many names. We've got Jenks, we've got Mark, Carl, BS, Assad, welcome, Radon, Thomas, Nick, Jell, Patrick, Ryan, founder Timeless Capital. So good to have you all here. Thanks, everyone. So this reference I'm wearing tonight, this is my usual workhorse that I love wearing. It is a Smith's Everest, which is just a killer little everyday wearer. I put the watch on, wear it without a care in the world. Um, if Dear Artifact is going to be joining us, he likes to promote the watch a lot on Instagram. I can post his name and everything else. So it should be a lot of fun. I think uh, I personally, like a few other watch YouTubers, have been quite fatigued by the idea of of Rolex and talking about sports Rolex and all of that. I feel the same way. I think we overemphasize it a bit too much. The thought was, why not just have a, a, an overflow of it and then give it a break for a few weeks? At least this way, we can talk about multiple subjects relating to these watches and you know, just enjoy the conversation. And of course, your feedback and the engagement is what makes it all the better. So like with every stream, as this year has started, I created a new way of beginning the streams called the live five. It basically means I take five watches that I found appealing or thought might be quite relevant to the stream. I put them together in a row so we can talk over these, get ourselves warmed up, and then we get into the show talking about everything else. So there's a few more names coming up here. Clive, welcome. Double T, WC. Great to have you all here. Watches and giggles. Nice to have you guys here. Okay, so yeah, how's your week been? I think that's a way to start. It's quite a sad day for me here because um, I am about to finish the last of the scotch in the studio, which is quite sad. So uh, I hope to refill and restock very soon. That's my poison for the evening. Had my usual double shot of coffee. Hope you're all kicking back and, you know, getting yourselves warmed up for this evening or wherever you are in the world. It might be early morning. Okay, let's see. Carl. Great to have you. Uh, you're saying, why is Rolex design easy? You can tell us at a glance that it is Rolex. We can go into that in more detail. There's, there's a lot of little key touches that I think it's very important to highlight. I think the first half an hour or so, we can get into the, um, what would we say, the housekeeping and run through the, the basics. But you, you've hit the first point on the head, Carl, saying that their designs evolve slowly. Their designs barely evolve at all. And that is so important. Uh, we can talk about car influences and, and other things. We can riff off that in a second. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I think we're going to have a great evening together. There's already like 70 of you joining. That is fantastic. So let's start. And again, um, if you would like me to see your comments in a bit more emphasis, when, when you tag me at IDGuy or with a hashtag before my name, uh, I get to see the comment. It highlights an orange on my screen so I can catch your comment very easily. And Clive, I won't answer that question of yours. Um, me and Stilettos, I'm not one. <laughs> so we've got Edward, welcome. Chili Badger, oh, it's so cool. It's so nice having you guys here. Um, 
Once again, I haven't even thought about watches for the last few days. I managed to prepare next week's videos all the way through and haven't thought about watches for a while. So it's nice to sit down and actually get into this. I might need to get into the right headspace to talk about this. So it should be cool. Nice way to begin the stream. We won't only be talking about sports Rolex. I want to broaden the horizon as much as possible and just enjoy it. There's a question about which scotch is in my hand. Aside, it's terrible. It's actually just a, a no name from, from Tesco. <laughs> it's very bad. I, uh, I've just been enjoying whatever I can get my hands on at this point in time. But, you know, it's cool. It's blended. It's, it's like three years old. It does the trick. I water it down a little bit because it's quite rough. But uh, it'd be nice to get a single malt one day soon again. The thing is with single malts is that they just disappear so fast. You can go through half a bottle in one sitting without a care in the world. It's quite dangerous. <laughs> um, this image shows how fat Rolex got over the years, pilot style. Yeah, I agree. Um, this selection wasn't really focused on anything in particular. It was just, I like the idea of black dials. So we can get quite a nice rounded understanding of just how their, their dial layouts look and how similar they look in the most part. Is this a Cellini episode, an all Cellini episode? For when we can talk about Cellini, of course. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, so it should be very, very cool. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, we've been running now for six minutes. I think there's, there's a good few of you in. So we can just start with the basics. And oh, one more thing. In the chat right now, I will link all the references that I'm going to be talking about. I hope I get this right. I've separated all the references by hyphens. So if you're watching this after the stream and you would like to see all the numbers in detail, if you're new to this, there are all the references separated. So we have an Explorer, Daytona, Explorer 2, uh, one of the coolest Submariners ever made, and Skydweller. So that should be fun. <laughs> There's a question by Clive. Uh, why don't show models that we can find at the AD? A blank screen, yeah. Uh, that's another thing. I'm going to try and ignore the whole hype factor and uh, you know the, the the steel sports craze and all of that. Try and try and avoid that as much as possible and focus solely on why these watches are so appealing. I, I said, what did I say? Why Rolex design is globally appealing. Should be nice to unpack that unpack that section. Okay, so from left to right, we've got. I'm sure most of us who are in the chat know what what these references are. On the left, we have a 36 mil Explorer, 14270. I just think it is, a 36 mil Explorer really is a character and one of the epitome watches of the brand. Uh, the way they've now left the 36 and jumped to 39, I think it's quite sad. It would be nice to see them reintroduce a 36 mil variant in the future. We can also talk about Basel World predictions and all of that too. Um, this Daytona, I didn't put much thought into it, but I thought it'd be nice to highlight the black dial instead of a ceramic insert as well and uh you know it's cool we can talk about just the sub dials and and how much i i don't enjoy the fact that they're offset the second rolex went in-house and left their zenith movements behind so the sub dials at the three and the nine o'clock shifted up ever so slightly and it looks kind of awkward we can talk about that just now rolex explorer 2 great reference and a watch that I suggested Thomas Burnett get himself. That was a really cool video, by the way. Earlier this week, I did a review of Thomas Burnett's collection and uh, a lot of fun. I'm sure he'll be in the chat later tonight or this morning, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> it's, it's coming up to it's 10 past 10 in the UK. So um, really interesting watch. It's, it's something that it took me some time to kind of, you know, grow on me. I can't personally wear a 42 mil Explorer like this. The size just doesn't visually look great on my wrist, but I can understand where the, where the interest is and why so many love it. I think the greatest advancement and what they made so important was the, the orange hand. That is the distinct character of the Explorer 2. And it's just beautiful, very legible, easy to read, just a lot of fun. And the Explorer line by far is my favorite uh, series of references in the family because they are just so unlike Rolex in many ways. Of course, this reference does have those GMT Submariner traits, but uh, it's, it's very unlike Rolex in the way that they've been arranged with steel bezels and they're nice and clean, just great everyday wearing watches that the average person doesn't know about. And I think that's the secret. And then the uh, five digit sub 14060, what needs to be said about this? I don't know if it's an, I'm pretty sure it's a pre M, it's not an M version. So it's, early 90s, 
Um, it's, it's a birthday watch for me. I think it's superb. Uh, it's one of those watches that you can just wear and enjoy and any enthusiast would say it's great. And then my recent interest is the Sky Dweller line. I, I made a video a couple of weeks back talking about the Sky Dweller being this watchmaking masterclass because they were able to take so much DNA from you know, the 50s, the early times when they were playing around with aviation and that whole idea of a dress watch, dress sports watch being used in the sky. And what they've done here is modernize it, but make it just as old school, interesting and engaging. Uh, Asad's asking, any reason why you've gone for black dials only? Primarily just because we can see the layout of the dials a bit easier. There's a bit more uniformity. Uh, I didn't want to divide it up with, I mean, in the beginning, I had a Milgauss on the screen and olive green, uh, Oyster Perpetual. I thought it'd be nice to cover just how simple the dials are. And one of, uh, Carl, Carl mentioned this earlier, it is the fact that they are so simple in the way they approach their things. And we can get into this in more detail, but the, the reality is these watches are not beautified by any means. They are very much utilities in the purest sense. Um, when we consider the other brands and what other brands offer nowadays, dress watches and the finesse and the filigree and the details, these watches are just utilitarian tools, as they always have been. But of course, now because they are put into that field of luxury and branded as such, the the term luxury watch has been affiliated to these watches now. And uh, you know, high price means this is a luxury item. So uh, take that as you will. I still consider Rolex watches to be utilitarian, not so much high end. You know, um, and in that way, they have always kept that status. The way they present their watches, they're not interested in adorning them with you know, filigree around the bezels and, and inserts and different colors. And they, they keep them very basic for a reason. And the reason I think Rolex has been so successful over the years, might as well talk about it 10 minutes in, is that they are so confident in what they do. Confidence for any brand to be able to push out and repeat what they do all the way through and keep everything relatively the same is important. Um, now, just for example, I'm not even going to pull them up on the screen. You think of the uh, the Ford Mustang, the Fender Stratocaster, Les Paul, Gibson, uh, uh, what, Ray-Bans, Ray-Ban Aviators, Ray-Ban Wayfarers. You don't even need to see them. Levi's jeans. You don't need to see these things to know what they are. In a similar way, you pull up the name Rolex and you immediately jump to a watch like the Submariner, for example, or the Datejust or the Daytona. You have a clear image of what that thing is. And a lot of brands, I'll just name drop Omega, for example, they don't have as much confidence in their design language and their, their motifs, which is why we see the Seamaster line being changed into dress watches and chronographs and everything in between. Um, where I think, and, and of course, the design styling changes. You have different plots, different numerals, different indices. But what Rolex has done with all of these models, this is just brass tacks simplicity. They don't go further than batons, maybe the use of numerals. I think that's what makes the Explorer 1 so interesting is that they've incorporated the numerals in there. Um, the Daytona, also very simple batons. The dial layout is unique to them. We can talk about that in a second. But with all of these references, they all look relatively the same, which is why there's so much fatigue between people. Uh, but it's that, it's that uniformity that all of these pieces have that makes them brilliant as you know iconic pieces in the watch world um so i cut it as soon as you like even if you hate rolex i think we can all agree that what they've done managing to stick to their design language and their motifs and everything over the years very admirable and the fact that they have the confidence now to keep this and not change it's just as good they don't have to i mean uh the term rolex has been coined everywhere and we can get into the hype side of things if you want but yeah a lot of fun. That was a good little tirade <laughs> for about 15 minutes or so. I don't know how long that talk was. And I've missed a million of your chats. So I'm going to scroll up and catch up. Uh, let's see where to start. Reed says, the five you have selected are definitely professional two watches. Yeah, they are. They're very much a workman watch. I would say the Sky Dweller falls into a, a slightly different category in that way. It's a little bit different. Um, but watch, interesting, Asad saying, um, 
At what point a reference to Rolex transition from tool to luxury? You know, we actually have them right here, really. I think this the, the 90s, you know, actually no, because they had gold and all of them, all the rest. These 90s references were probably the last of the tool plastic style pieces. And then all of a sudden we transitioned to more high polish, bigger lugs. The second the presence of the watches went up, I think they, they transitioned. And of course the materials changed like ceramic inserts. You notice that I don't have any ceramic models here. Uh, that's, I don't know, my preference, I guess, that I pulled up. So I'm just going to close this off. I think we bored about seeing all of these and we can pull up just a few images that I've pre-selected for the page. And I can catch up with all of you here. It's a really interesting discussion running through the utilitarian side of things, not talking so much about luxury, but just what they've been able to do, positioning themselves. Um, I see Jeremy saying he's buying the Seamaster Professional. It's a superb watch. There's nothing wrong with it at all. I'm just saying in the context, when we compare it to a brand like Rolex, Rolex seems a lot more focused on what they do. Uh, and that can be considered a good thing or a bad thing. Many of us get extremely bored by the brand because we just see this all the time, but it's effective and it works. Um, of course, you have you can enjoy Omega. There's some amazing watches from their family too. Um, I want to keep this, like I said in the description of this video, a little bit, if you scroll a little bit down, I said Rolex only stream. So I really want to focus on the brand as much as possible, run through anything and everything related to Rolex, whether it's modern, vintage, and something interesting that I'd like to highlight is one of the watches that I think really changed the game was the Churchill Datejust. This was gifted to Winston Churchill in 1948, roundabout. The Datejust was invented in 1945, right as the war ended. And it was the first watch to ever have a revolving date. Think about how important and imperative that is to the industry and what it's done for the watch world since then. Fascinating story. But I think that that transition to sports dress began with the date just in the family. That's when we started seeing, I mean, think about that time period, 1945, 1948. We were about to transition into the 50s where we had the, the turnographs and all of those bits and pieces. So I think the original date just was one of those pieces that really started the trend. A lot of fun. Uh, so the question I mentioned about design fatigue. It's a common denominator of all major iconic. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, lots of companies feel like they need to keep pushing the boundaries and experimenting with their ideas. But a lot of the time, if you want to keep something long lasting, just keep pushing it out. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You don't have to change the design because you might feel it's boring. Just, I mean, the Volkswagen Beetle, for example. Is that car perfect in every way? I love it because I own one, but I mean, it's, it was just a utilitarian vehicle that became so popular because they, they kept pushing them out no matter what. Um, uh, Robert Fawn mentioning this, the Cellini time. I'll pull that up just now. So we're going to keep running through these comments. I've missed quite a couple, so I'm just going to scroll down slowly but surely and catch you up. Um, not a fan of the Cyclops. The Cyclops crystal is something that is subject to debate. Uh, this date just didn't have it. Maybe they, they didn't use Cyclopses back then. It was quite a later change. And actually, uh, do I have anything that has a Cyclops? The GMTs do. I honestly think that the Cyclops lens was a bit of a quick thought from them. It wasn't something as well refined as it could have been. We look at just the way the, the top's being cut. I mean, if you actually look at a Cyclops lens and you see what it looks like on the watch, it could be a lot more refined. Let's be real. Uh, we see what Panerai has done, putting the, the lens on the underside of the crystal. But again, Rolex is just dogmatic in the way. They don't care if it's not perfect, that it can be knocked off. Uh, they just keep producing what they think is best, what they've been known to produce all the way through. And because of that reason, it's popular. Everyone knows what a Cyclops lens is. Think about how impactful that is. So it's a great discussion to have. I thought it would make a good video, but then having a bit of community engagement on the side and you know an extended timeline, it would be... Uh, it would be so nice to just expand this discussion further and further. And there's so many different subjects we can chat with about within the lines, of course. Um, Chamberlain's watch still smells like urine. <laughs> uh, okay, so Fulman Colossus. Had no idea the crown extended out on the Churchill. 
I hate Tudor Black Bay Prawns. We can talk about Tudor as well, since they're pretty much in the same kind of category. Um, it's amazing how the design language hasn't changed that much, just evolved. Yeah, and it's, it's so gradual and procedural. Think about the 911 Turbo in a similar way. Um, you know, they went from air cooled to water cooled, but the body, the form, if you have to see the side, the side ele elevations of all the cars over the years, is horrifying just how similar they look. They've kept the same format all the way through. So yeah, that, I think I, I kind of covered the, the opener by, by highlighting that it's that procedural approach. Even though their designs aren't the greatest, it's because they've been repeated so many times and just used and used that they have become quote unquote iconic. I know the term iconic is not appreciated by a lot of people. Rolex went away from tool watches when they added the date to diver watches. David Coffey, and that was the, the 1680. You can pull one of those up quick. Also have a Daytona tab. Let's see. I love this Churchill date just. Wouldn't it be nice for Rolex's anniversary to release a solid gold date just? Something just like this. With beautiful leaf hands and just stunning. Beautiful watch. So add 1680 Submariner we can begin with. And as always, we just continue riffing as it goes. Uh, whether you want me to pull up a certain model, we can do that as well. That's kind of how we roll here. And I'm still warming up. It's only been 20 minutes. I can't believe it's been 20 minutes already. Jeez, time flies. So this was the first date watch, the date Submariner in the family. I do find it pretty strange. The fact that they kept the, the no date all the way through, the 5512 and the 5513, all the way through to the 80s, it's pretty amazing. Um, yeah, catching up with everyone else. No, uh, let's see, I'm trying to catch up with you guys. Once again, if you tag me at ID Guy, I'll be able to see your comments a lot easier and I'll be able to catch up. I've come to realize that Rolex has a monopoly on simple sports designs. Anyone else who attempts it is automatically derivative. Ron, very good point, interesting line. And I've just missed a super chat. Thank you, Steve, so much. Am I right in thinking the Explorer and Explorer 2 didn't have a price increase? If correct, could this mean a possible change coming? I did not know that that was the case. I don't even know how much, how in demand the Explorer line is in comparison to the uh, this other standard sports models. Again, the Explorer line is, is one of those. I think it really is a, an enthusiast watch through and through. 1016, absolutely stunning. This is a UK specialist watches.com or co.uk. I love the 1016 on Jubilee, it's stunning. Um, I don't know anything about the price increase and the change. I just know that these models generally are a bit more available than whatever else you see, the Daytonas and the GMTs and all that. But it really is an enthusiast watch. And the fact that it doesn't look like a Rolex is just the best. I mean, I've met someone in quite a public space and he was wearing a, a Explorer without a care in the world and just saying nice Explorer, he, he gets it. You know, there's, there's a watch enthusiast everywhere. You just have to keep your eyes open. There's a question from Tippy. Welcome to the stream, by the way. Uh, what do I think of the Rolex 16263? <laughs> yes, that whiskey is strong. <clears throat> 16263. Is this a, a two-tone? I thought so. Oops, not shopping. Sorry, sorry. Date just. But we can chat about date just at length. I've got a write-up that I'm working on. Oh, awesome. It's a turnograph. Thunderbird. Nice. I've got a write-up coming out very soon about date justs, which I hope to really expand upon and look at what makes a great date just, what, uh, what makes it a bit strange, looking at the dials and the layouts. I think the, the turnograph especially is one of those unsung heroes at this point in time. Uh, I, I made a video about the RAF, what was it? The, the, the Air King, and also ran through the turnograph references over time. and. Really, for an everyday wearing watch, I think it's superb. The fact that the bezel blends so well and that it doesn't even look like it has a minute track on it, I mean, a, a countdown timer, says something quite cool. It's very understated. And the way they've done the fluting on these models, it's really characteristic, reminds me of those vintage date justs from back in the day. I really love subtle fluting on a bezel. It makes it so, so cool. 126600, the best diver ever. It's a really sick piece, David. Um, okay, so Justin Bailey says, I'm trying to catch up with you as quick as possible. Sorry, I tend to uh, drag on <laughs> certain subjects. Uh, he says, no model got my attention more than the 5513 on Roger Moore's list. Yeah, 
uh, live and let die, James Bond. I wanted a Rolex before I knew. And in a similar way, I, I felt the same. I remember watching reruns. The way I got into Rolex as a, a kid, you know, I must have been about seven or eight years old. I was watching uh, reruns of Sean Connery and Roger Moore. Every year they would have a series on a local channel where they would do a rerun of uh, all the James Bond films over the years, every night for a solid month. And I remember seeing this watch. It was, it was the, the big crown with, with no crown guards. And I do distinctly remember watching Roger Moore in, in Live and Let Die. I didn't know what the watch was at that age. Didn't know what Rolex was. Wasn't interested in design or any of that, but uh, saw this watch and thought to myself, you know, that is so cool. I love the balance, love the proportions. And as a kid, you, you don't know what you're looking at. You just think it looks awesome. But of course, the same time I grew up in the, in the Pierce Brosnan era, so got to see all of those Seamasters. I thought the way they integrated the Seamasters into the film was genius. Uh, the watch looked so technical. I've talked about that a lot before, that the Seamaster had that gadget aesthetic behind it. Anyway, sticking to Rolex as much as possible tonight should be a lot of fun. Um, so the blueberry would be into nice. T yeah, Jedi, good, good uh, line there. Let's have a look. Let's pull one up. So there's this watch is shrouded in mystery. Uh, I highly recommend. I don't even know what the reference is. It's a 1675, 1675 blue, I guess we would call it. So there's so much debate about this reference, whether or not it's, it's real, legitimate, if it's a fake bezel and all the rest. The one person I trust with this kind of information is Cam from Craft and Tailored. He spent a lot of time looking into this watch and the family. Highly recommend. He made a video about this a while ago. I highly recommend you open a tab, type in Craft and Tailored Blueberry, and he goes through the reference and talks about it in more detail. There's, there's someone in the comments who disapproves, disproves the thought that this is, in fact, a legitimate Rolex model, and he gives a full-on essay response covering all the details. Jeez, I'm talking a lot. It's insane. Can you show the first Rolex to use Mercedes hands? Forbin. I wonder if the Mercedes Rolex was the one to use Mercedes hands. That's a good question. Uh, let's see. If I type in Mercedes Rolex and she was, uh, of course, they're going to give me the Mercedes car. If I type in swimmer, maybe we'll get something. Um, did they use a Mercedes hand on this model? They didn't. And if I remember the history behind this, love the resolution, by the way. If I remember the, the history behind this piece, it's she wore it on her neck or something. It was strapped around her neck. So no, the term Mercedes, I think, had something to do with, with, this, uh, with, with Mercedes, the swimmer. But of course, we know that the handset itself looks like the logo of Mercedes-Benz. So it's, um, I can't reference. Let me think. Uh, early Submariners, probably. One of the first Submariners. What would the reference be? Um, let's pull one up. We say Rolex Submariner won't be a 55. I'm bad with my four digits. Uh, 5508 or pencil hands, maybe. Um, I don't know. One of the, I'd, I would imagine one of the first models that really had the, the hands, the, the Submariner, and it must have been one of the early, early four digit references just after transitioning away from pencil hands. Uh, I would imagine the 5508 would be the first. Could be wrong. I think it's a 5506, maybe. It could have been even before that. I don't know. Let's see. Let's try and pull it up. I'm thinking on the fly, and we might be getting somewhere. 5506. No, I don't think that's a legitimate reference. I would imagine the 5508 was the first. Um, just as a transition, just as it received Submariner on the dial for the first time. Great question. That got me thinking for a second. Um, OK, Jeremy's saying, I much rather the old sub case. I don't like the super case. Yeah, the super case is point of contention. I know a lot of purists seem to like the, the idea of a, of a thinner, tapered case. And in reality, let's just, this is a beautiful, Hodinkee takes some amazing shots. So this is a big crown. This is a uh, James Bond, Sean Connery model. And you can normally tell that by the red triangle and the size of the crown. But this is a four-digit reference, which means that it could be an even earlier model because the later models weren't chronometer certified. I don't know. But we're talking, we're talking late 50s, very early 60s here. Um, the reality is, we look at these watches now. This thing is, what, 
50, 60 years old, looks just as great as it does now. And let's actually talk about super cases. That's a great point. Uh, who was it? Who mentioned it here? Um, Jeremy. I'd like to pull that up now and chat about it a bit more. One of the first videos I did going into this essay format, talking about the watches, I spoke about Submariner and the super case. And from a quote unquote industrial design standpoint, the reason why they wanted to make the case this size was primarily because of appearance on the wrist. They wanted to make the watch look bigger than it is at 40 mils. But at the same time, they also wanted to uh, increase the lug's longevity because they learned over time that polishing cases that are slimmer like this, you lose the metal very fast, especially when it's in the hands of someone very inept at their job. And what happens is you get terribly over-polished watches. So doubling the size of the lugs not only increases the watch's visual presence on the wrist, also increases the steel's longevity. In a similar way that the ceramic bezel, sapphire crystal, all of these components are there primarily to increase the watch's lifespan so it doesn't quote unquote age. Really great point. Thanks for that. Um, and G says, just picked up a, v a Vacheron Constantine Blue Dial 56 self winding on bracelet. That's superb. Yeah, like again, again, guys, sorry, I'm going to keep this all Rolex focused tonight. This is for the person who's new to the, the hobby, who's interested and wants to learn a full. Uh, Different different format on Rolex design and why it's so appealing. Tonograph is cool, Jeremy says. That's a lot of fun. It's a really nice watch. Okay, catching up. A Blueberry reissue, Basel World 2020, Assad. That is a great, great thought. We really have, again, I, I say this as much as possible. We should all sit back and say, okay, either we're going to be astounded by something really cool or we might be seriously disappointed. I mean... It would be great to see something like the Explorer 2 getting a revamp with a ceramic bezel. That would be nice. But of course, that goes against what this watch was about. In saying that, the, the newest 43 millimeter Sea Dweller received a Cyclops. So you never know what, what's coming. Um, but in a similar way, we might be so disappointed by what we receive. It's really difficult to tell. And uh, I, I don't know. Don't don't hold your breath. I'll say that much. You you never know what you're dealing with with the family. Um, you should look at brands that are a bit more adventurous. Again, Rolex has high, have, the hype for these watches are so out of this world. You don't need to explore into other areas really. They're probably just going to bring out a series of gold related pieces, gold or rose gold. I don't know. They make a Submariner in rose gold. Oh no, I think I might have just hit it. They'll make a Submariner in rose gold, something like that. Just simple, uh, you know, nothing, nothing out of this world. You have to like think of your most outrageous thought about these references. What could they do? Uh, let's think a blue dial explorer or I don't know, a whole new line, a whole new family, and then take it back and say, no, they won't do that. So they'll just release a rose gold Submariner, for example. I don't know. Uh, you never really can tell. Jeez, I've, I've missed your chat so often. I always go on these tangents and talk. Anyway, I'm going to catch up. Once again, if you tag me in the chat, I'll be able to see the, the comment a lot easier. Um, anyone own a Yacht Master in the chat? That'll be nice. Found the Times Capital. I'll have a look at that now. Uh, what do I think of Ice Blue Daytona, Tippy? Is it the model with the brown bezel, this piece here? I really like the combination between the, the brown and the blue. Stunning. I love brown. Brown as a color on a watch is superb. And on that thought, let me pull up the new Root Beer GMT. This model, I think, is one of the greatest modern releases from the family, uh, just because of what it's managed to do. It manages to stay understated, but also extremely wearable, more wearable than a lot of other references because of that brown and rose gold two-tone finish. Um, which is why I have this feeling that they'll do something like make an all gold or two tone rose gold submariner. It's like, it's so obvious. And it seems like they're going this way because they're introducing everything in rose gold as time goes by. Um, <laughs> Relax changes their references like the steel of Titanic. Omega is like a drunk driver at 2 a.m. Yeah, Omega does seem to take a lot of wild shots. It's nice to see that they're willing to take risks and explore and try new things, but at the same time, they can miss the mark a lot of the time. And that's a problem for sales. But then again, they uh, 
they do make amazing sales over time. The Maxi case was the Panerai effect, uh, the noughties, most was filed into. Very interesting. And as we, as we see now, Assad, they're, they're bringing the cases down. They're starting to taper, taper them in. So we might see a big change over time. A rose gold sub would just be gross, Jeremy. Well, people said the same thing about the, uh, the two-tone uh, Sea Dweller that came out. I had, uh, what is it, Sea Dweller 43, two-tone. I wonder if they'll understand what SD means. It does. That's good to know. I, I find this just so perplexing from the family. I really don't understand it in the slightest. You, you take a professional watch, you add a Cyclops to it. Okay, that's fine. We can understand that. It's cool. And you apologize to the community by uh, adding a red line of text. Fine. And then you make a two-tone. It's like, hey, you want to put more dust in our eye? <laughs> you know? um, so two-tone sub, Founder Times Capital say, one of his predictions. I think, yeah, a rose gold sub might look quite cool in two-tone. But again, it just looks like everything else. So I really don't think, again, I'll emphasize, I hope I get this right. Don't have your expectations up too high. Um, I will definitely uh, be covering them when they're released, I hope. Um, do I think that the Yacht Master 2 will get discontinued, Paul says? Good question. For those of you who don't know the Yacht Master 2, let me pull one up. These Pepsi, these 1675 Pepsi GMTs are just to die for. I think they're beautiful. It took, I, I wore one once on a Jubilee, absolutely brand new condition from the 70s, beautiful watch, and it's just, it's heaven. So the Yacht Master 2, I made a video about it a few months ago saying why it's so hated. And I talked about the complication and the feature. Uh, it's, it's the most crazy and ridiculous watches in the family. The complication is very admirable in a similar way to the Sky Dweller, actually. There was a great comment on the Sky Dweller saying, why would you need to know the month? You know that it's January. You know that it's June. So that's, that's important. I think that's, that's a very good comment. In a similar way, this watch having a 10-minute countdown timer, I mean, how useful of a complication is that? You can use it when you're you know, boiling a, a pot on the stove, but that's about it. It's not like uh, you can use it timing more elaborate tasks. And the aesthetics and everything else, it's very Marmite or whatever your – or vanilla. Vanilla is a better word for everyone who's around the world. Mm. That what they just what I just don't understand and what really made this watch just raise eyebrows is the idea of incorporating the name in bold on the bezel with the numerals and everything else. It's just so un Rolex, you know, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, Mark P says the Rolex 6200 was the first to use the first to use Mercedes hands in 1953. Uh, thank you for that detail, very cool. She said, Am I that far behind on the chats? <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a question from Pilot Star saying the 6512 very flat. That sounds really interesting. Let's pull that up. Got so many tabs open. Again, I highly recommend you jump onto Craft and Tailored's page and look at the Blueberry. He goes into a lot of detail talking about the bezels, a lot more than than I know for sure. I mean, geez, I'm I'm such a novice in all of this. Very flat. It sounds like a a quartz piece, but I might be wrong. Oh wow, hand wound. And this is, this is the family of pieces that I'd love to get into more detail with. I mean, look at that. I didn't even know this, this watch existed. Thank you so much for the suggestion, Pilot Style. So this is a screw-down oyster case. Absolutely beautiful. Dress watch, simple. Has the Calatrava aesthetic behind it, but is distinctly Rolex. Love the hand styling. Uh, the size is probably about 33 mils. Um, so anyway, going to keep running through while we go through this. Uh, talking about rose gold and Rolex. Sky Dweller with a brown dial. I think any model in any family with a brown dial is a win. Uh, superb color choice because of its toned down nature. If you want to learn more about that, I did a video all about the Rupia. And in it, I compare this to the original and talk about just how practical a brown dial is on a watch because it blends so well with your skin. It's so much more casual in any kind of clothing. It really doesn't speak loudly. And the one modification I made to this watch was to, to give it a coffee-style brown color. So superb. Let me pull up the very flat again. I love this reference. What a superb-looking watch. What do you guys think? I, th I think the idea of having an oyster case around a dress watch is superb. And Doc Bapp's saying, please discuss the Cellini line. I will. Also made a video about the Cellini line. It's amazing how many videos I've made on Rolex in the past. Um, 
I really, really enjoy the Chilean lion for one reason. And the reason is that this was so unnecessary from the family. Is this a good enough picture? I think it is. Rolex really didn't need to introduce this watch in the slightest. They did it solely for clout. Uh, to get their to get their name out there to prove all the top brands that they could still create dress watches So this is this actually ties in very well with the very flat I'm imagining this watch comes from the 60s possibly maybe uh, 1959 Wow look at the condition of this model solid that is absolutely beautiful I mean that is a statement in itself hey? 1959 it looks brand new oyster case so you can use it in the water absolutely stunning so this, this whole idea of deciding, okay, we're going to stick to sports watches. Once, once the date just really perpetuated and moved further in, and we got the Submariners, we got the GMTs, Rolex had really established themselves as sports watches, as, as a sports watch family. You know, they wanted to be that utilitarian machine. So to all of a sudden say, okay, let's just arbitrarily, I think this was 2012-ish, they said, hey, Let's just create a dress watch. It's very bold. I mean, they, they really didn't have to. They're doing it solely to show all the other names that they can, that they are willing to, and they can still make a beautiful, beautiful watch. And I want to run through the reference in a bit more detail. I like to, I like to talk about this watch in some detail, so it's cool. Um, let's see what else is going on here. Look at the bark bezel with a brown dial for when I will. And I see a super chat from Thomas. The man, the myth, the legend. Yeah, again, anyone joining the stream, if you haven't seen Thomas Burnett's collection, highly recommend it. I made the video on Thursday. It was a lot of fun. It was such a joy. Uh, I'd love to extend the time period. What's crazy is I looked at the analytics of the video about five hours in. It had 150 hours of view time. Just factor that in. Five hours into the video being up, 150 hours of view time, meaning that you guys were interested in the collection, and I think that's superb. Really stunning. The Milgas for me is just the winner in that collection. I think it's so, such a character in the family. Oh, strong, strong. Okay, so we are going to jump onto this Cellini for a bit. Mr. Super Chat above, I just got a cheat on. Uh, tempted by the Milgas. Again, guys, you need to engage in the chat and, uh, you know, Communicate with amongst yourselves as well. <laughs> Just so, uh, and the side asking, did you get the Explorer 2? So the reference, the, the model that I highly suggested for Thomas to get at the end of the video was an Explorer 2. I think the white dial would be superb because Thomas has larger than average wrists. And I think it would just pair so nicely with the Milgaard because it has that complication. It's got a beautiful orange highlight, which he loves, that 70s style aesthetic cheetah and i didn't see a super chat from you at all no oh no i'm gonna scroll up and have a look uh and there we go there we go my friend has a rolex sd116 okay i'm gonna pull that up now thank you for the super chat cheetah let me pull that up as well gorgeous five digit reference sea dweller one of the best absolute killer so i recommended this explorer specifically to thomas because i think it is just stunning uh again it's a watch i can't wear it's a therefore i can't appreciated entirely um so uh but still this is beautiful the contrast the colors the layout stunning okay getting back to the cellini and while i'm doing that i'm going to pull up the 16600 which is the creme de la creme sea dweller in the family 40 millimeters the real final there, there were two periods where the sea dweller really, really outshone the rest. The final aluminium aluminium bezel, or aluminum for those of you under, over the pond, uh, this was the final hurrah for the aluminium bezel family. And then the reference afterwards, the first ceramic introduction was just as exciting. So we can run through that now. Okay, I'm going to quickly jump onto, once again, the Cellini line, chat about it again. So Rolex giving the finger to other high-end brands. Another thing to highlight is that I don't believe they had any aspirations to make this watch something that would sell in mass numbers. They, they really just wanted to push it out to show people that they could do it. And the attention to detail, I, I've discussed this in streams before, the attention to detail with this watch is stunning. They understand space on the dial. 
I, I said that they have put a lot of thought into this piece. You can see that concepts have been experimented with in many places. They, they keep the oyster style case, but the dial space, the way they've arranged the batons, having the minute track set offset in the, in the middle nearly allows for the hands, if I can zoom in any closer, I can't, allows for the hour hand to just touch the first set and the minute hand to touch the second set. It's just a, a stunning use of space. And the bezel, again, the fluted bezel is just perfection. I think a fluted bezel like this says a lot about the family. They, they really are aware that they want to make a dress watch a dress watch, and they don't want it to be shouty and aggressive. And uh, two fingers salute to Patek. Yeah, very good. Uh, it's, it's really something cool. I, I think more people should look into the Cellini line. Also really enjoy the idea. Why, why would it give me such low res? Oops. <laughs> Magic mouse ain't so magic all the time. Um, I think more people, especially Rolex junkies, should look into the Chinili 9 because it says something quite a lot about when you're able to rock up with a watch like this to an all steel watch wearing party and say, hey, yeah, I'm wearing a Rolex. Yeah, it's a dress watch. You know, that's how I roll. Stunning. Really interesting piece. Okay. Um, how does the Chinili 9 sell, Jeremy? It's, it's nowhere near as popular as the sports references, as date just. It is a very niche watch. I think when Barack Obama decided to wear this as his anniversary, you know, when he, when he left office, it got a lot of interest for that reason. But for the most part, it's nowhere near as popular. I don't even know if they still have them on the shelves, to be honest. Very interesting watch, though. Love the, love the date. This is something that I think is so important with dress watches. When they can extend the date complication and have it visible on the dial, it's just so much more classic and elegant for that reason. Looks great. Okay, I'm actually keeping up with the chats for a change, I think. <laughs> There's a question from Tippy saying, Globemaster versus Datejust versus Cellini. Um, okay, okay, what should we do? Datejust, we can pull up some references now. I just wanna catch up with the rest of the chat and I'll see from, from a design perspective, do you consider Rolex evolutionary instead of revolutionary? Evolutionary. Very good read. No, I consider them evolutionary for the most part, not, not revolutionary. They, they really struck gold with the, the Oyster case. That has always been their claim to fame. I think the best watch we could probably look at is just the standard Explorer and get a good feeling. They really, really struck gold with just a simple Oyster case. And they've built their entire line and their family around the idea of a waterproof watch case. Um, and ever since, they've just been expanding, whether it's changing the dial material, changing the types of Luminova, changing the size, the proportions, types of bracelets, all of that. Um, bracelets is another very interesting, to talk, uh, interesting thing to talk about in the family. They're, they're so well thought out in the sense that they're understated but exciting and uh, there's a lot to cover. As, as much as we suffer from Rolex fatigue, I think there's still a lot to cover in the family. And it's, it's nice to just focus on the family for a change. It should be a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> Clive says, are you kidding? Cellini is the only thing that ADs have on their shelf. I haven't seen any, Clive. The ADs that I've been looking at, just window shopping in general, I don't see them often. I usually always see OPs and date just for the most part, and then just ridiculous gold pieces. Which watch brand would you consider as a revolutionary then? Matty, very good suggest, very good question. What do we think would be revolutionary? You know what? A brand like Breguet, a brand like Patek, um, names that have had such a huge influence in the, in the field of just watchmaking in general. There are lots of them. We could say, I mean, a lot of the, the in-house, just recently, actually, how's this? Uh, the new Moser Streamliner. Okay, this is the only time I'm going to pull up a separate watch in this video. Uh, this watch I'm doing a video on next week. Spent some good time doing a write-up on it. I think it is the most inspired sports watch we've seen from any family in a long, long time. Not just the aesthetics. The aesthetics is something important. So it's, it's bizarre that they decided to go all 70s and just incorporate all these crazy little motifs like uh, bullhead, fish scale bracelet. The dial is solely a racing dial. It's, it's absolutely stunning. But the movement itself, flyback, column wheel, automatic. Uh, this watch is 120 meters waterproof, water resistant. 
for that reason, I think a brand like Moza is revolutionary instead of just evolutionary. They, they give the finger to the industry for the most part very often. And I think that's exciting. It's engaging. And then we look at other brands like Breguet and the rest uh, who incorporated all sorts of different methods, different bridges, balances. Any brand that, that manages to bring a style forward that is translated to other families, I think, is something to take note of. So you look at the Breguet numerals, the Breguet hands. How important have they been for watches over the years? Very important. Over coils, the hair springs, the tourbillons, all of those bits and pieces. A lot of fun. I'm liking this discussion. Nice and uh, thought-provoking. You're getting me thinking. Rolex was revolutionary in saying, saying true to mechanical watches during the course crisis. Yeah, it's so very good. And, of course, they had oyster quarters, but uh, the fact that they kept mechanical all the way through and left it there, great. Um, but really, I think the oyster FP Jean revolutionary, also very good. Uh, the fact that they kept the oyster case and, and used that as their base plate, it's a brilliant, not only business practice, but just in the sense of developing anything, having a single chassis to use, like, like an air-cooled engine, and using that all the way through with all of your models over the years. It just proves. And, you know, just take, make minor changes like crown guards, change the size of the bezel, the size of the case, the crystals, everything else. Um, Hans Wilsdorf Marketing, yeah, simplifying watch technologies was revolutionary. g -Town. I mean, another thing, talking about revolutionary, the date complication, date just. That watch literally made the revolving date complication. Think how important that has been over the years. So, okay, I redact the statement of the, of the Oyster case being the only thing. They have made some incredible changes to the watch world when it comes to just think about how many watches incorporate a rotating date wheel on their pieces now. It's, it's mind-blowing. It is absolutely mind-blowing. Um, Founder Time is Capital mentioning the Streamliner. Oh, I, I can't wait. It also took me a while to sort of warm up to it. This is very strange, but I am so excited to talk about this piece. I would love to get involved with some kind of collaboration project with Moser because I think they are really, it's one family that, that know what they're doing. They understand that to make a difference, they have to work to get somewhere. You know what I mean? Uh, they're not just copying and replicating someone else. And the, the discussion on this piece is going to be going through all the references, the, the Alpine Eagle, the Patek Nautilus, AP Royal Oak, Bell & Ross, BR05. There's trillions of them that all use the 70s motif. Moser brings out a chronograph incorporating a bullhead design, racing dial. It's so different and engaging, exciting. Uh, I look forward to discussing it. I'm really pumped. I just have to edit it together, and it'll be ready by Thursday next week. So you heard it here first. Um, a Rolex bullhead would be a revolution. <laughs> uh, which Rolex would you choose uh, to own from the current collection and why? Doc Baps. Brilliant, brilliant suggestion. Okay. I'm just, uh, it's very boring. I'm sure most of you who've been on the page often enough know what I'm going to say. But it would be the Batman GMT on a Jubilee. And I'll emphasize it again. I, I say it so often. I, I've told you the story a million times. So uh, hold back the yawns while I just explain it quickly. We know the Rolex GMT movement is one of the best movements that the family makes. Very exciting. Uh, but the use of color with this piece has to be one of the best for any GMT complication. Blue and black, indicating day and night sky. It's just practical. It makes sense. I love the Jubilee bracelet on a GMT. It's much more comfortable and gives it that dressy format that you want to see from a, a GMT line. I think the divers and the explorers can keep their oysters, but the GMT needs to have that X factor, and that's where the Jubilee comes in. So of all the watches in the family, I would say this one is the piece I would go for. I know it's cliche and boring and yawn-inducing, but um, this piece says quite a lot about what Rolex has been able to do with their line. It's, it's quite a... Uh, important piece in the GMT family. Of course, the Pepsi is the one that established it, but red and blue doesn't make as much sense as black and blue for a, a GMT complication. Um, love the combination. It's also, I've, I've suggested this watch so many times, people who've asked me my opinion, uh, just because it's so casual, easy to wear, usable, fun, exciting, great complication, that's superb. Let's pull up some Daytonas while I catch up the rest of the chat. I love when they put baguettes in the dial like that. It's gorgeous. Um, so I broke the rules, did I? 
router. What happened to the DC? Okay. Uh, I did break, of course, broke the rules jumping to Moza. Okay, I'm not going to do it again. I'm actually going to close the tab. Uh, it's the one watch that's really had me thinking a lot over the last week, and I'm so excited to, to talk about it more. Um, okay, so Thomas Burnett, and as mentioned about uh, black, black and blue also matches clothing tones. Absolutely. Uh, blue is a very common color. We Most of us have either blue eyes or we like blue as a color for clothing and jeans and shirts. Black is just ubiquitous with, with clothes in general. Um, okay. Thomas Burnett, thank you for the super chat again, brother. Earliest photo that I can find in Mercedes hands is a Rolex from a 1939. Oyster Perpetual bubble back has a California dial. Let's pull one of those up. We don't chat about them often. Uh, bubble backs, that, that craze, I, I really don't know much about the bubble back family. And uh, let's just type in California dial and you'll get something. Uh, it's it's a top, it's a topic that I need to cover in more detail, study up on, and learn. Let's see if I can find a reference with a Mercedes hand. Here's one. So this craze came and went over the years. Uh, people were so keen on them. A couple, you know, in the through the '90s, if I'm not wrong. I don't know if I'm the only one, but I'm so not a fan of the California dial. It's one of the most perplexing dials on on a watch for me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite lenient. I don't mind most dial layouts, but this one to me just doesn't make much sense at all. And I'm trying to remember the story behind the California dial. Something like a, a certain watchmaker used it on his pieces. Didn't he, he refinish dials and give them this layout and it was adopted as a California dial. It was something that services would do back in the day. I can't remember. Um, Okay, and Ron says, what is the weirdest thing you do to get a 1655 for free? I would work my ass off, Ron, I think. <laughs> I, would, I would put a good year's worth of my time and energy into a very, uh, not a 1665, come on, 16. I tend to make that mistake often now. Um, I would put as much effort as I could into a project. Uh, I would dedicate my time to, I don't know. I would spend a year writing about this watch every week to get the 1655. I mean, how's that for, a, for an answer? There's so many little things that I find so influential about this piece um, in a very similar way to the Moza. It's, it's a very exciting watch in the family. It's so peculiar. It's so unlike Rolex. I mean, it looks like a Seiko for the most part. Um, and it has all these little enigmatic 70s motifs like the handsets and the big orange hand and the um beautiful bezel and the the way they've done the minute track around this piece reminds me of a racing dial no so it has all of those parts another thing to to highlight um i'm going to be discussing the omega speedmaster mark ii in the next well not next week the week after next i'm working on the write-up now a lot of fun talking about the speedmaster uh the racing dial that they adopted in the 70s i think that that translated into this piece somehow some way I think it's so exciting. I've hyped this watch so much. I'm sure this the just over the last year that I've been doing this, I've seen the prices of these pieces go up. So I don't want to say that I am um, influential enough, but uh, it's sad that I'll never get my hands on these pieces at this point in time. Uh, you know, if I'm unless I'm very lucky, of course. Um, okay, so let's see. Would uh, would you do something for a solid gold sub that your father wouldn't be proud of, Ron? You know, me and solid gold, I am not a fan whatsoever. I, it's just something that's never appealed to me. Um, and a solid gold submariner, no. It doesn't appeal to me in the slightest. I'm probably alone on the subject. Uh, the same thing with, with the president, with the day dates in general. Uh, let's just pull up solid gold. Haven't discussed them much. Uh, submariner. It's just one of those pieces that really hasn't ever, ever, I don't know what it is. Uh, it's just not my style. I wasn't a kid of the 80s for sure. I was early 90s. I missed that train by, you know, two years. But in saying that, it's just nothing, there's nothing about it that really stands out to me. The application of a Submariner being this thing to be taken in the water and used hard and worn hard, seeing it in gold, don't know what they were thinking with that development at all but uh you know she sounds saying how about the the 228206 play date is that a real thing sounds like you're pulling my leg <laughs> let's have a look 
uh, if it's, you know, I, I feel, okay, let's see what happens. Uh, what's the reference again? 228206 uh, play date. I probably got that completely wrong. What the hell are you getting me to pull up here? Play date. Is that what they call this? Platinum day date? Is that the term? Okay, I've learned something new. I did not know that. Uh, that's a very good play on words. Who said that? Was that cheat on? I'm guessing it's the, it's the day date. I'm just going to catch up with the rest of the chats. I, I really love the dial on this piece. Um, and then white gold, much better. I'd much rather have white gold over, over yellow gold all the way through. Um, okay, let's see what else is going on before I catch catch up. Uh, Founder Times Capital says, I see a 1655 in my future. You know, I would love for that day, James. It'd be such a pleasure. Only in a tracksuit. <laughs> Everyone needs to get handled a good piece. Is that why we wear luxury? Um, that, but, but the stud, everyone wants to get their hand on a good piece. Is that why we wear luxury? You know, as much as this, this comment would probably anger a lot of enthusiasts in the Rolex family. I really don't consider Rolex watches to be luxury in a sense, comparing to other big names out there. Um, I find them to be still more focused on the utilitarian front. They make beautiful dress inspired pieces. I mean, this, this for example, makes for an excellent everyday wearing watch in yellow and white gold of course, very luxurious in that sense. Um, but uh, it's, uh, you actually, the question was, isn't that why we wear luxury? Everyone wants to get their hands on a good piece. Yeah, of course, of course. And I've, I've kind of deviated away from the Rolex design global appeal, but you know, uh, we'll get back into it, I'm sure. Um, there's a question about my thoughts on something or other. Let's see. Um, am I the only person in crazy enough to call it a play date? I love that, G-Town. That is really funny. I thought you were going to pull up some kind of Playboy magazine article or something, Garth. Didn't want to get cut off for... Uh, for nudity on the stream. There are other channels that are very good at doing that. <clears throat> um, so what are your thoughts concerning the use of a meteorite dial on Rolex watches? Very good question, Doc. Doc Baps, like that name. So gorgeous. I, I think this, this collection of colors and materials and everything, stunning. Love the blue, uh, really, really nice. And talking about meteorite, uh, let's see, Meteorite Rolex, the first thing that comes up. Wow. Okay. So this is the one that, that everyone's talking about, the Pepsi. You can buy Meteorite dials for much cheaper prices. But of course, because it's Rolex, they can charge whatever they want for it. So what is unique about Meteorite? Well, it comes from space. Hey, cool. Good start. Um, what else? Well, it is like a fingerprint in a sense because no two dials will be the same. It's almost like, this is actually a good comparison. We think of spider dials on the original vintage pieces. We think of patina. This is as good as you'll get for patina on a model like this. And I think that has some kind of draw to it. That's just something that's come to my mind now. Reminds you of, of spider dials and that uniqueness factor. Uh, personally, it, it doesn't really uh, say much. Um, this watch with a white dial would look insane, would look gorgeous. And I think the white gold with the blue dial looks just as exciting. But it's, it's interesting. Texture on the dial is always something cool. And we know Rolex is not really a family to play around with, with guilloche and tapisserie and all of those things. They, they really do rely on the elements when it comes to finishing their models. Think about that for a second. They're not, they're not ones to have hand guilloche. Uh, so for that reason, they're incorporating material like Meteorite to give you that desired effect. The best they do is you know, sunburst finishes for the most part. Um, Mr. Marcus, welcome. Very nice to have you here. So this is cool. There's a chat about <laughs> Meteorite dials. Uh, let's see. Uh, meteorite dials just don't show... Just don't fall out of the sky, you know. Yeah, that's your favorite line, Clive. You always said <laughs> meteorites just don't fall out the sky. Um, yeah, only only in micro brands. Founder says he only likes meteorites in micro brands. I think on on a model like this, it's just hype perpetuated to the nth degree. I really don't think it's necessary. Just because everyone wants it, doesn't mean it's worthwhile at all. 
it's nice seeing a texture change. It's nice seeing some kind of uh, inspiration and use in a different way. But at the same time, it just, mm, I don't know, it's not as exciting. There's so many other brands that you can get meteorite dials for. Uh, and let's just pull up, uh, let's see, Blue Dial GMT Pepsi. This one, one of my favorites in the family. I think this is how the Pepsi should be arranged. Oh, let's get a better picture. I saw a full screen one a second ago. Yeah, that's cool. That to me is a knockout Pepsi GMT. The use of color. I said this in the last stream, I think. The, the use of blues and reds and just how they contrast, how you see them so easily. Look where the blue is on the dial and the blue on the bezel. The red on the dial, red on the bezel. Great relationship. Uh, much better than just your standard black dial you know a lot of fun really enjoy it okay uh let's see black bay 41 verse 40 36 dial proportions mr marcus says um, let's have a look so black bay 41 36 dial proportions should i bring up a black bay uh let's see black bay 41 is that that's not the, the ranger it is the ranger okay okay well, here are two examples. This is the Black Bay 36, and this is the Black Bay 41. Now, it's it's difficult to, to quantify because they use their, their dial spaces a little bit differently. You think of the Explorer 39, how different those two models are. Um, where's a good picture to use? The 39 mil manages to address the space in a different way to the 41 mil. I'm just going to focus on the on the 39s, the battle of the 39s. I think that's more appropriate. This this whole layout idea, I'm sure many people have emphasized this before, but, but the snowflake hands on a dial that has rounded plots just doesn't work. All you need to do is make it a snowflake dial and you would win over so many more people. This is bizarre and strange. This looks like it's a domed bezel. I don't know if that's the case. It looks like the bezel is rounded. And what a dome bezel does is it actually brings down the visual presence of the watch as opposed to a flat bezel. Uh, bending the light actually makes the watch look visually smaller. Quite an interesting little detail that many people don't talk about. I don't know, Black Bay line, we can talk about that in more detail in a second. I'm just trying, this guy's got some hairy arms, yo. <laughs> Let's, uh, I'll just stick this up on the screen. The Explorer is still one of those pieces, even if you hate Rolex, with a passion, you can always find something about the Explorer. There's some elements to it that attract you to the watch. Uh, even if I, I really do believe anyone who doesn't know, you know, even the, even the devoted hater of Rolex can still appreciate the Explorer. Okay, trying to catch up with all of you. Again, if you tag me in the chat at ID Guy, I'll be able to see your comments a lot easier and be able to reply to you. I find it so difficult to catch up with everything at once. Also try to um, save time by catching up with the chats that are directed to me. What do you think of the black dial? I think I'm, I highlighted that already. Question about the black dial and the blue dial and the Pepsi. Yeah, Cheetown, I answered that quite fluidly. <laughs> uh, okay, how about the Smurf rooted rotor? The Smurf Submariner is a, is a strange one and we, we've seen it, uh, I mean, I personally think the blue on blue with yellow gold is a more appealing color scheme than the Smurf styling. There's something about the color of the Smurf that doesn't... Mm. Am I the only one to think that the coloring looks kind of cheap? <laughs> I know this is a white gold watch and it's the most expensive Submariner that you can buy. Again, it's down to ceramic. It's down to the way they've used the color on the watch. I just don't think it is as vibrant as it could be. It's, it's a bit too bright. Uh, I think brightness is what makes it a little bit peculiar. We compare it to the likes, this is a good picture, we compare it to the, the Seamaster, the latest Seamaster 300 that's been brought out. Their idea of using the blue very subtly so that it, uh, it looks almost black in some lights, I think is a lot more appealing than this bright blue in your face. Uh, that's just my opinion. Rooted, I've seen, I've actually tried on a Smurf before. And the color to me was way, way too bright. It just didn't feel natural, not as elegant in, in my opinion. Um, Coke GMT with brushed oyster links, Cheetown. You know, that could also be an option. They could easily just bring out a Coke GMT and, and that be it. I really don't think you should expect much. 
2020 being quite a monumental year, since Bowser World is now Rolex World for the most part, maybe they will bring out something cool. Very difficult to really highlight and know. Um, can a real man wear a mother of pearl dial, Crappy Luxury says. I don't think so. Uh, the mother of pearl dials, again, they're, they're very peculiar. I love this, this very flat. This was a great suggestion. I think Pilot Style highlighted it. Uh, let's see, Rolex pearl dial. I've seen a few of these in the flesh before. <laughs> great question, by the way. Um, I mean, on the Daytona, for example, it's just peculiar. Again, another great point. Uh, once again, we see that Rolex is not using Guilherme. They're not using tapisserie. They are using the elements. That seems to be a feature that they like. They use marble dials. They use porcelain. They use, uh, what else, wood grain dials. All sorts of things, but they never do their own in-house dial work. That would be something to look into for the family. Uh, but the color, I mean, it's just, if you like that, I guess, if that's your thing, then then go for it. Um, house rules broken, number two. You know, what happens on the third strike, founder? <laughs> it's funny. Uh, so um, I'm catching up. I think I'm catching up. Sometimes I just have to scroll through. I see someone saying, good evening. Truth fears, welcome to the show. Um, Smurf, not unlike the Pelagos Blue. Yeah, good point. Okay, what else is going on? Talking about date just Linendahl. Linendahl, brilliant. Junior Johnson, excellent point there. That is one of the references that we can highlight. They, you know, since I'm on the fly half the time, uh, I tend to miss bits and pieces. The Linendahl is a good example. Uh, that's, but is that a, I don't even know how they do this. Is this just a brush texture? What about the, the American Psycho date just? Um, the American Psycho date just had that, had that gold set, what do they call it? I'm just gonna say date just American Psycho, maybe I'll get it. <clears throat> those 80s references that had those straight, oh, there we go, there's your answer, I made a blunder. They have, in the past, done their own dial work. They should bring this back, it's very cool. They could, they could be so explorative with other things. Um, so, James Conn, nice to have you here, I don't think I greeted you. Would you wear a Daytona Solidite diamond dial? No, absolutely not. <laughs> I don't even know what solidite is, but uh, anything with a, I can just imagine what it would look like. Let's see, I'll pull something up. Daytona solidite, let's let everyone else have a look. I don't even know how to spell it. Let's see, is this the piece here? Oh, geez. You know, I will, I will say it's beautiful solidite. So I'm guessing it's a type of stone like granite, right? Um, it's a beautiful finish. I mean, they, they really know how to set diamonds well when they, when they work in-house. It's definitely not my cup of tea. It's something that producer Michael would enjoy. Um, you know, it's cool. I like the color. The color scheme is quite nice. Um, <laughs> here's Rolex. Okay, let's have a look at, there's a question about the OP36. Okay, Cheetown, the Oyster Perpetual line. In reality, we're talking about Ah, oh, geez, watch that one. These are the only watches that we can really get at authorized dealers nowadays. If we really have that Rolex bug, uh, these watches are the ones that the majority can grab. Now, they are just quintessential Rolex. I mean, you get all the details that you want out of the watch. Uh, and again, this, this kind of emphasizes what Rolex design being globally appealing. Everyone knows what this is. Uh, you don't have to be well-versed in understanding Rolex design at all. You can see this and understand what it is at a glance. Just because of its simplicity, it epitomizes the brand. And I will have a look at the 36. Have we looked at the Sky Dweller in black, Rooted Rota? No, but I will pull that up. I think Sky Dweller is exciting. And the black dial especially. The Most, most want to see it in um, blue. The blue dial is very impactful people like that but i think the black dial especially when you see it in the flesh where's a nice res picture it really has that i don't know it's it's difficult to quantify your thoughts and express them in a single thought about this piece because it, it has more of a dress nature to it it's much more built around that that elegance but a black dial makes it sporty makes it quite adventurous for that reason very cool 
uh, I really dig it. Richard Grosser, I think it's great. Again, what made this guy do so cool is that they really reached back to their 50s motifs and try to bring them to the modern era, uh, make it into the, the pilot's watch that it should have been all those years ago with that complication. Um, the date just will make a comeback, Mr. Marcus. Well, of course, it's one of the only watches that you can really get. The date just has never really come out, gone out of fashion, Mr. Marcus. I mean, think about just how many people buy date justs on a daily basis. So many people. Uh, they're everywhere. And you can, it's, it's actually so daunting. I'm doing a write up on a date just, and it's so daunting wading through all of these pieces, thinking about what works, what doesn't work. I mean, you have tuxedo dials, you have roulette dials, you have blues with fluted, you have batons, Romans. Uh, there's so much, so many little details that you need to consider. What makes a great date just? Like that is, it's like an almost impossible to answer point because everyone has their own preference for the line, right? Um, so it should be a nice discussion. I, I look forward to it. I don't know how much justice I will do to the watch, but it should be fun just to cover them in more detail, really share as many references as possible. Um, personally, I think the date just at 36 mils, great size, great for everyday wear. And one of the reasons why I think the date just worked so effectively at 36 is because the bracelet blends in with the case very well. There's almost a direct proportional relationship between the bracelet and the, the case itself. So let's just pull it up on wrist. Here we go. You notice how the bracelet and the case are almost directly in line with each other. There's, there's this almost seamless blend between the two. I think that's quite appealing. Says something a lot about the date just back in the day. They're really cool. Um, and of course, now that Steel Sports is getting just so overblown, I would love to take it back, to roll back and look into date justs, oyster perpetuals of varying sizes. Um, so the question from Assad, I've missed a lot of your chats, but I will catch up, everyone. Do you think aftermarket diamond devalues the design? Assad, I think it does. I don't. Uh, it's not something in my uh, expertise by any means. I'm not someone to really comment on that. We know that it devaluates the watch's resale, um, but it also affects the watch's design. I mean, when the watch, difficult to say. I mean, Rolex does their own in-house diamond setting too. So what can you say when a manufacturer does the same thing to their designs? It's a very good point. Uh, nice, nice question there. Um, how about it? Oh, geez. I hate this. When I scroll on the, on the live chat, it, it decides to jump when it wants to, and then I miss the... <laughs> I missed the chat. Tibby says, how about a dress watch stream next? By the way, where's the German stream? I'm going to get to it. Since it's the beginning of the year, I'm still waking up to watches again. I uh, thought it would be nice to focus solely on Rolex. And the idea was to make this something to be good for an archive, for someone who's interested in the design of the family. I, I gave a good opening speech for about eight minutes that covered just why Rolex design is globally appealing. Uh, very interesting. And I'm sure I'll, I'll emphasize it more later on. The return of the Rolex Zero Graph. I have a look at that just now. That sounds cool. I've missed so many of your chats. I'll be catching up to you now. Um, let's see. We still haven't talked day dates, Pilot Style. Another brand. I mean, I, I would say day dates is an area that I would need to research and look into a bit more. Just look at that. It's always a strange, charming piece. Um, Day dates have quite the history being given to presidents and being worn everywhere. But I think it sits in a similar ballpark to date justs. I think day, day dates need to have that elegance, but understatedness, formality, but also sports, uh, nature behind them, which I think 36 just ticks the box. Again, you get them in 41 and they're just as cool for bigger wrists. This watch in gold says something. It really makes a statement. I would actually love to cover this piece. I will. Date just first, then we can get to day date. <laughs> Save ID guy from bad whiskey. Yeah, it was a bad call. It was one of those spur of the moment things. Uh, I picked it up, but I would love to get some really good whiskey very soon. That's the plan, at least. Um, what about the Rolex 6062 Dark Star? Okay, let's pull up some of these references. The thing is, there's so many questions coming in. Uh, and Dear Artifact, welcome to the show. It's good having you here. Um, let's see. 
Super chat for Adi Guy to drink something you wouldn't use to light a fire. <laughs> yeah, this stuff is rough. I will say that much. It's very, very coarse. But you know, I like blended whiskey because it slows you down. When you have single, it just it goes through you so fast. And before you know it, <laughs> you're on your ass. <laughs> uh, do I prefer date just with Jubilee or fluted or smooth bezel? Dark baps. I think the date just really is epitomized by. Okay, this is just my personal preference again for the big, big wristed gents in the audience. 36 mil fluted bezel Jubilee bracelet. That to me is what the date just is. Uh, very interesting time for the family. In the beginning, I chatted about the, uh, the Winston Churchill date just and how that kind of started the trend for sports Rolex uh, and all of that. Um, but I think this this format is really the epitome, and it always has been the style for the family. Another thing I really like are Romans on these pieces. Roman Roman dials are very interesting. Uh, batons are cool, but they're a little bit basic. Um, but it's fun. Uh, Tippy says, "What if Rolex is not globally appealing, but rather just marketing?" And we can talk about we can talk about the hype factor and everything else. Jeez, I really have to flush this whiskey down with water. It is rough. Really gets you in the back of the throat. <clears throat> so we know that Rolex is dependent on the hype factor and that their, their pieces have been used in films. And because of that, there's just such broad appeal and interest in them. But I think there's something more to that. Uh, the design says something about the family. Again, emphasize this in the very beginning of the stream. Uh, something very unique to the family. The fact that they are so... They keep to what they know well. And uh, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Jeez, I've missed so many, so many chats. Okay, I'm going to catch up with all of you guys now. Oyster Case is a masterclass. Oh, dear artifact, that's, I've said that uh, a little while ago. I think that's the real evolutionary, or oh, sorry, revolutionary part of Rolex's design. What they managed to do with the Oyster Case and the fact that they've used that as their chassis, superb. Can a man, a real man, wear a pink dial? Crappy luxury? Yes, I think so. Very cool. I think pink is cool. Uh, we see pink shirts often. Uh, pairing that with a pink dial, as long as it's like a pastel pink, then yeah, why not? Rock it. I think anyone can rock anything. It's, it's how you wear the thing at the end of the day. If you're going to be showboating this thing off, then of course you get sneers and you get uh, public derision. But uh, if, you, if you rock it and you rock it well, you don't draw attention to it, you can wear anything. And you, you hear these stories about people getting mugged and everything else. There's a way to wear a watch to not draw attention to it. And it's, it's you know, you learn that over time. Um, Japanese single malt. I have never tried a Japanese single malt. That's a first on the stream. I love my scotches, but uh, Japanese single malt, never tried it. And I'd love to. It'd be awesome. Um, okay. Smooth bezel for the Explorer, fused with date chest. Yeah, very good. Blue Romans, that's also a cool. Blue dial is stunning. Okay, West Virginia moonshine, crappy luxury. Yeah, I do like my bourbons too. Bourbons also really hit me, and they're they great. I need to actually get, I want to get some, um, what's that name, Maker's Mark. Um, their designs are simple and not quirky. Jeremy, very good point. Yeah, that's another thing. Actually, looking at this reference, this this Explorer reference with their with the numerals, I think the numerals are quite quirky in a sense. And in saying that, have you have you seen the latest Milgas? <laughs> uh, the Milgas is such a crazy looking piece. And I did a whole. I really suggest you look at a video that I made about the Milgas. I called it the Einstein Rolex, and I covered just how the Milgas evolved began, and let's just talk about it, actually. This should be a lot of fun. It began with the 1019. Now, this has to be, you know, if, I shouldn't have done that, 1019 Rolex. If Rolex had an anniversary model to reintroduce this year, this, I would love this as a prediction. If Rolex brought out this reference in 39 mils, a reissue of a 1019 mil gas, I think everyone would lose their, S -I it's H-I-T. <laughs> I mean, this thing is just, it's absolutely beautiful. I think in many ways, this is just another personal opinion, I think it tops the, the Explorer in a few places. Just the subtlety, the, the color choices, the, the minute track on the dial. It's the same as a 1016 Explorer case, of course. 
but you know wow uh where to begin there have actually been some renderings of the 1019 i don't think i'll find any here uh here we go i actually wanted to i wanted to include this in the uh the live five at the beginning of the show this if they reproduce this oh my goodness it's just so cool but if they had a, a red lightning bolt seconds hand to it so quirky so exciting the milgas has this strange development where it began with the 1019 this very subtle, understated piece. And then it transitioned to this crazy uh, four-digit reference with a turnograph bezel. And I'll pull that up too. This is quite fun. Uh, I'm going to just take a wild guess here. Milgauss Rolex, and it was reference 5. 55, uh, 5.3. Some of these old, you know, the old references. I'm just going to say Milgauss turnograph. I tried. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to guess and you, you might be lucky. I'll just say bezel. Maybe that'll be better. Uh, so it evolved into this reference here. And uh, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. This was the first. Oh, geez. I'm forgetting my history here. This was the first Milgauss. Here we go. I'm getting this right now. So belay what I said earlier. I'm sure everyone's getting angry in the chats that I mentioned the wrong reference first. This was the first Milgauss, a turnograph. They had no idea what they were doing. They just decided to just throw everything in, gave it a lightning bolt seconds hand, made it look quirky, didn't give it loom, anything like that. Red bezel insert, just strange and crazy. I consider this the, the Einstein Rolex because it's just, it was built for the application of science and everything else. But uh, it's just so out of this world and strange. Then they decided, okay, we're going to pull this and we're now going to jump to a more refined and elegant Milga. So then they introduced the 1019. And it, it worked itself off the, the 1016 case and design and styling. They just toned it down. They made it more subtle. Nice red accents and highlights. So what they've done with the recent Milgas, which is very interesting in the developmental side, is that they've taken the quirkiness of the original bezeled Milgas with the lightning bolt and just emphasize that aspect, but kept that restraint of the 1019 in one unit. Very exciting watch in the family. So as far as quirky watches go, I don't think it gets, <laughs> I don't think it gets much more quirky than that. Uh, Frankenstein, um, the Frankenstein Rolex. It's a really, really cool story. I think Founder Times Capital says, never seen that before. It's such a strange development. Highly recommend you look at the video. I go into a bit more detail talking about the reference numbers and the history. Uh, it's a four digit. How strange is that for a model? They really didn't know what they were doing. It was just as the tonograph arrived. We had, I think this arrived at the exact same time as the Submariner, the GMT. This fell into the same ballpark. And just how it evolved into this crazy looking piece z blue as well also emphasis the, the color scheme also emphasizes the watch's application in that space uh being used for anti-magnetic properties and all of that a lot of fun okay catching up with everyone else uh nice to see that many makers 46 and elijah craig are better than makers mark shot in the dark you know if i could i would lock myself in a room and do whiskey tasting for a week straight Dear Artifact says, that's the Milgas for me. I'm guessing he's saying the 1019. Stunning. So with regards to Rolex, I'm sorry about the screen going white when I transition. I really don't know why it does that. Uh, the computer sometimes has a mind of its own. This would be such a cool reissue. I would love to call it. For 2020, they bring out a re-edition of the 1019 Milgas. Give it that toned down effect. This will probably be as in demand as a sports model. I think, and you, you know, brand families like Hodinkee and, and all those big names will be pushing these watches out more and more. They'll be saying Rolex reintroduces the revolutionary 1019 and it'll get all the hype imaginable. And so, yeah, anyway, love the honeycomb dial. The artifact says, yeah, that was another, another reference within the Milgauss line. That's too cool. Um, so yeah, we're talking about, uh, breath. I see founder saying, um, Thomas Burnett. Okay, I can I can give I can give Thomas your email. Sure thing, no problem. Um, and if you'd like to get in contact with me, anyone in the audience, uh, if you go to the about section of my page, 
you can reach out to me via email. I'll try my best to respond. Uh, socializing comes like fourth in the list of things, preparing videos and everything else. I love the fact that we can sit down and chat about these things. The idea that I can put a good, I shoot like a, oh geez. Uh, I, I find it quite sad when a, when a family goes that far out and starts broadening their horizons into areas that just don't line up with what they've done in the past and everything. Um, you know, for someone who does does design, it makes a bit more sense. But for a company that's solely around watches to suddenly broaden out into other areas, I find it very peculiar. But I guess, you know, money is money at the end of the day. Um, I'll give you my mobile as well, Thomas Bennett. Okay, good. Um, so the question from I am blues, um, I am blues, I am blues. <laughs> How do you feel about the yellow gold Daytona with a green dial? The John Mayer wear. So as we know, I mean, that video that uh, Ben and John Mayer did, uh, what is, there's, a, there's it's, an, it's like, I think that the better way to say it is it's Daytona LV. <clears throat> That's how you, nope, that didn't work. <laughs> Obviously, Google's not that smart yet. So we know that that, that Talking Watches episode with Ben and, uh, and John Mayer, it's got like 2 million views and John was saying just how important these references are and of course now they're in demand as much as it's amazing just how the hype machine perpetuates with social media it's insane so uh i personally i think the white the white gold or the blue dial is a bit more interesting the green if you like that if you're irish i guess since i'm south african i should appreciate the green and gold because that's the color of my uh, my rugby team, my cricket team, all of that. Uh, but still, mm, doesn't do it for me. Uh, yellow gold, I think yellow gold really needs to stay with a watch like the day date. On other pieces, I don't think it works anywhere near as well. But that's a terrible, terrible opinionated thought there. Um, it's pretty cool. But I think the, the, blue, the blue dial is a bit more interesting, uh, a bit more rich. I really think more brands... Or, sorry, more watches in the Rolex line should emphasize this kind of radial blue dial instead of just, uh, you know, think of the Smurf Submariner. Wouldn't it be nice to see the Smurf Submariner with a blue dial like this? Let's get a better res picture up for you guys. And I'll carry on with the chat. Time and Tide watches. They do some amazing stuff. Love their stuff. Look at those red accents. That is awesome. This, this to me says a lot more about the Daytona, a lot more exciting. Um, let's see what else is going on here. Shame about Proteas against England. Oh, we won't even discuss that. I'm not much of a cricket watcher, actually, but I just know they got slaughtered. The worst thing is South Africa has been doing so well with sports. Won the Rugby World Cup. Uh, got a ladies netball team that just won. We had an ice hockey, no, just a hockey team that won. Uh, water polo, all the sports. And then cricket, they completely botched it. So that was funny. Uh, Nikhil, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. I've actually caught up with the chats for the most part. The Golden Hulk, she Tom says. That's funny. Uh, we really can't judge what's going to come out, but you know, I'm going to I'm going to throw in and say a root beer, um, root beer. Sorry, rose gold submariner. Anyway, have you tried roast cauliflower, Chi Tong? I have. Yes, I have. Uh, my family is quite into food. I've tried all the food. <laughs> yeah, I love it. You're talking about diet again. That'll be a whole different story. Vintage Rolexes. My daughter just got the Rolex Zenith Gold Daytona, vintage in Paris. Oh, you know, vintage Rolex is another whole field. I mean, we could do a separate stream just on vintage pieces. I think we balanced it out quite well. Talked about Milgaus, Datejust, a Yachtmaster recently, you know, Daytonas, Submariners. Um, let's get back into the Submariner and just bring up a 5512, one of the references that I really find endearing because it's just... It's those end links I love so much. Why a watch, why, why watches in the family could not adopt these sealed up end links with a case? It just looks so much more natural. It looks so much more organic, you know? Uh, I love it. I think it's just such such a gorgeous thing. Um, thoughts on the Gégé Lecoutre Memovox, the Tuxedo Dial. Dear Artifact, I'm keeping it all Rolex tonight. That was my thinking. It actually, it makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't actually... <laughs> I have to have to spread my thoughts into other areas. I wanted to keep this chat tonight focused and honed in on one brand for a change. 
just to save my my mind a bit. But we are going to get into more broader topics as the months go by. I wanted this to be a good archive for anyone who's interested in Rolex design. I hope someone new joins the channel and says, hey, this is cool. Why, why is Rolex design appealing globally? And I addressed that in the beginning of the stream. Uh, Chi Town says, I heard the Springboks had a rough couple of years. Oh, geez. Don't, can't even begin to talk about it. It's pathetic. And it's all to do with money, to do with politics. It's to do with ridiculous, terrible coaching. Um, it was a complete just mind blow that they won the World Cup. I'll say that much. Um, wearing a Rolex around Joburg must be an interesting experience. Aside. Yeah, I'm from Cape Town, so it's a little bit safer down there. But in Joburg, it would not even, not, not even cross my mind. Uh, is there enough Breguet to make a stream about it? Yes, there is to be. Absolutely. That'll be a lot of fun. And I plan on, you know, I plan on uh, discussing broader watches like Black Patek. There's, the thing is, it just comes to knowing references. And slowly but surely, I'm learning about these references. In your video about the over under, do you burp at 248? I have no idea, Simon. Um, I, uh, that was a long time ago, 2015, probably not. Those videos I used to do with one take and it was a pain, pain in the north. Is Johannesburg dangerous? It was supposed to be nice from the shrink. I hope that's sarcasm. Uh, South Africa is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be. I'll say that much. Um, so Wade Revolution has best been watching his live stream interviews. Much better coverage in time of time. I really enjoy it. And I'd love to do a video discussing Revolution Watch because I think they have some of the most interesting content on the platform with regards to just how they do their discussions. They don't net the views. They don't net the, the same level of audience that other watch YouTube channels do and get. Um, but I think it's just so impactful when you get to talk with someone like John Goldberger and focus solely on... Cartier Tank Centres or a very unique Patek or talking to uh, brand representatives of different names and running through certain models, just running through Omega Speedmasters, for example. It's amazing, amazing, uh, very unique take on the discussion. I really wish they would get more attention, actually. They, des they definitely deserve more attention. Uh, the knowledge from not only Wei, but the, the people they speak with, it's great and very insightful and entertaining. So Clive is saying, I have to stay around for another hour and 25 minutes. Why is that? <laughs> I heard someone, there was a mention at the beginning of the stream that it was going to be a four hour long stream. And that's, uh, that's a bit bold. Uh, let's see. Let's see what else is going on. Sorry, I missed the chat again. Uh, I love it. it the, the chat has a mind of its own half the time. Um, wouldn't mind one brand of chosen a future pilot style. I think it would be great. It would be nice to just chat about certain models and certain families. I'd love to talk about Breguet. I could talk about Breguet all day. Um, Patek as well. Lunga. Oh, let's do a Lunga stream. Maybe not next week, but the week after. Lunga only. I'm so underqualified talking about their movements, but I just think they are so beautiful. Uh, that would be a lot of fun. So we can do that. That would be very cool. Um, okay. Let's see what else is going on. Uh, top, top Rolex, 5513. That's a great suggestion, Pat. Nice line. Uh, Daytona Pink Panda. We'll have a look at that now. Love how bezels fade. There's so it's, it's just crazy how, how the chats deviate to different areas. Um, 116505. The nice thing is with Rolexes is that you tend to always manage to get the references quick and you get the ideas out there fast. Instead of having to search up giant tourbillon master chime calendar super special edition, Rolex is just like five or six digits and you get the name up. I think this is awesome. This of the Daytona line in rose gold, I think this is stunning. Love the contrast between the dial, uh, the the simplicity of having the plots and the sub dials the same color as the tachymeter two tone for the most part, you know. Um, love how bezels fade. Yeah, me too, dear artifact. Do I like Amarula? Crappy luxury says. Crappy luxury from America talking about Amarula. That's impressive. Yeah, I love it. And the best thing is, uh, if you don't know anything about Amarula, it's a, it's a liqueur from a very special Amarula tree in South Africa. And uh, elef elephants and all sorts of animals get drunk off it. You could actually, uh, if you go into Google and you type in drunk South African Amarula animals, you'll find that there was a tree that had all of its fruit spread on the ground and the whole reserve ate 
these these amarula fruits for everything from elephants to warthogs to springbok and, and giraffes and they were all plastered and falling around the place that that was it's so funny i highly recommend uh go to south africa for the game drives that's all i can say it's such a beautiful place i can't wait to travel out i want to travel back to kenya botswana have a good look at the plains uh, you know, I just want to, another thing is when you've been to a place like South Africa, you want to stay out in nature. Uh, Africa is best when you see it in its wildest sense. So there was a suggestion from Clive about the rainbow Daytona. I mean, you know, what did John Mayer said? He said, who would think it would be a great watch? Who would think it would be cool? I put it in the same kind of category as the leopard Daytona. I just don't get it. I, it's, I love the cutting. I love the color. The, the whole canvas of color that they used. But, you know, another slip, sip of my uh, lighter fluid. <clears throat> do you know a meager reference numbers, as BS says? Absolutely not. It's impossible. How do you do that? There's like 50 numbers that follow with decimal points and everything. Uh, I, I saw a super chat from Thomas. Thank you so much for the super chat, brother. Could you talk about a rectangular piece? Any chance you could look at the Cellini prints? Very good suggestion. Thank you again for the super chat, brother. Uh, the Cellini Prince, it's an unloved duckling in the family. There really aren't many rectangular Rolex pieces. So a lot of people really like it. They dig the idea that it's in a rectangular form. It's a strange piece, right? It has that gondolo style format and uh, very unique to the family. I definitely wouldn't consider this Cellini material for Rolex, but it does play into that 30s aesthetic. Um, it's peculiar. I'll leave it up for a second while everyone's chatting, and I will catch up with the chat. I've missed a lot. Um, my sister lived in Joburg for 35 years, has have been rob robbed at gunpoint three times. <laughs> oh, Mark, shame. Well, I'm, I, uh, you know, it's that laugh was out of sheer awkwardness. That's not out of humor. It's, it's just scary how much closer those statistics get the longer you stay in a place. Um, that, was, that was my main reason to leave the country. Uh, it's just at my university, for example, there were riots going on. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, how the hell can I stay here? I can't study when the place is being, when people are burning the buildings and stuff. And uh, for that reason, left. It's almost like you shouldn't be in a place where you know that you're going to eventually be a statistic. It's like that living in, in fear that you should get away from as soon as possible. What Rolex would you pair with your VW Bug, G-Town says? Oh, I think the Explorer is just a great option. I think it's just simple, subtle, very quirky in the way it's been done with the numerals. Um, very cliche. I think for a 911 Turbo, you want to get the 1655. What's another example? I love the sub, Ugh, you know, as, as bad as it is, sometimes the most cliche points are relevant in these discussions because the watches really are great. When you break down all of the, you know, all of the hype and all of those details and you, you get to the bare bones of the argument, hype is uh, something to add, but some of these watches really are impactful and important. Original Lunga or New Lunga? Tippy. Geez, well, Vintage Lunga, I don't know much about, but we can talk about the whole family. It would be cool. Mr. Marcus, best Rolex homage? I would say Smith's Everest, the watch that I'm wearing tonight. I think it's just superb. I've really gotten into the idea of looking at homage watches that are inspired by vintage pieces. Um, I have a Chronotac Explorer, which is basically a very, a very good reference to a 1655 Explorer II and little Smith's Everest. I wear these watches all the time because they're just so casual, understated. I've touted and, and hyped this watch up a lot. I think it's superb. I did my own little custom job with the bracelet. I found these really great solid end links that fit perfectly, nice rivet bracelet. I was passing this watch around at a meetup. Guys who had lungas and everything else, they were just as interested in the watch, which I thought was cool. Actual watchmakers thought it was great seeing a, an homage to a 1016. So it was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. So we're going to get back to this, this oyster prints, and I'm going to keep on original Lunga versus Glashütte. I always say, is it Glashütte? Or, I always say Glashütte. I guess that's a bit of my Afrikaans coming through. Um, cough, cough, meager references. Okay, I'm going to catch up with everyone else in the chat. Do I like Biltong, someone says. You know, you can't be South African and not like Biltong, I'm afraid to say. 
Uh, it is the most amazing food out there. I could live off the stuff very easily. If anyone doesn't know what biltong is, it's, it's a dried meat. Basically take whatever meat you want, whether it's beef, whether it's uh, from, uh, it's normally red meat. So it's from game like kudu or any kind of antelope. Leave it in the sun, season it, and there you have it. It's basically raw dried meat. Don't add any sugar, any preservatives, just salt. And it's the most amazing thing you'll ever taste, especially fresh is the best. Chocolate Dal Daytona on Oyster Flakes. Hey, that's a cool suggestion, James. So just referring back to the um, tippy, we've already looked at the GMT Meteor Rice. Uh, just referring back to the this, this Cellini. It's bizarre, eh? Has that very 30s gondola aesthetic. I don't know, I don't know what the majority thinks about it. Um, I mean, this is one of the originals, no? This is a first. It's pretty cool. I like the I like the way they've done the lugs and the case. Almost looks like a tank that has this integrated lug feature into it. It's pretty cool. <clears throat> Excuse me. Whiskey is getting to me. Okay, so we're going to jump to Chocolate Dal Daytona. Chocolate Dal Daytona. It's pulled up here. I just I blow myself away thinking about how much I talk in these streams. It's unreal. How anyone can talk as much as I can it should be should be a felony. So this Daytona on the Oyster Flakes, I think, is cool. And the, the color scheme is also something. Very nice suggestion. This was from James Conn. Um, the brown contrasting the rose gold, the black dials, the, the, the black bezel, black strap. It's really appealing. And I said in the beginning, brown dials on a watch makes it so much more wearable. Let's see if I can find a photo of it on the wrist. But again, when you look at it on the wrist, depending on the light, I mean, it just disappears. So it's difficult. Uh, it's another thing. It's, you're, you're dealing with wearability issues when the watch is, is so reflective in the light and you lose a lot of that detail you want to see. I mean, here's an example for a photograph. You lose all of the numerals on the dial because they aren't set. I must say, a Rolex does have some weird aesthetic choices with a lot of their pieces. Let's be real. Sometimes they do go a little bit, a little bit too far <laughs> with what they do. Uh, okay gonna see what else uh watching him sniff a female shoe oh geez mark p that was that was entertaining um i jump on i jump on streams often when i get a chance uh you know it's a certain beret wearing man named bill Saunders who loves the chinini prints well bill Saunders, if he is the guy who appreciates it then by all means it's something that you should look into he is very much the the older tim mosso uh he is really a junkie when it comes to movements and cases and everything else and there's something about the Rolex GMT Master II greater than the Rainbow Daytona. I would, I would imagine so, sure. Okay, catching up with all of you here. OP39 with a standard 911. Very good, very good suggestion. And I think I've said this many times about the Oyster Perpetual, the one watch that I would just love to get. And there was a mention about it in the, in the last stream. Someone, I, I don't know who it was, but someone in the chat said that he loves this watch equally to his uh, his Daytona. Please tell me it's going to load. Is it really that low res? Of course it is. Oh, no. Magic mouse in all its glory. Here we go. I don't know who it was in the chat who commented, but said that he loves this as equally as he loves his Panda Daytona. And I think the color scheme is just so characteristic and stunning. I, I love it. I think I think any olive drab on a watch is exciting. Um, okay, I don't think for a second that I could have one watch collection. No, dear artifact, me neither. The more the more I think about it, anyone who is interested in watches doesn't have a. And I don't think it's possible, really. I think it's a, it is a mental illness. It's like someone who loves cars. You don't just have one car. Generally, you have a, you know a project car or at least one drivable car in the garage, but also one car that you're working on all the time in a similar sense i don't think you can sounds like beef jerky junior johnson says yeah full tongue is beef jerky i don't think a person can just have one watch if you are a watch enthusiast i think it's it's just wrong <laughs> i think it's a felony that you're drinking brown colored <laughs> uh it really does i mean tonight it really has hit me i had a double a double shot of coffee and that was good um would I like to see a brown dial OP36 or 39? Hell yes, Cheetown. That's a superb, superb suggestion. And what would they pair with the, I mean, what they love to do with these OPs is 
is highlight some kind of spot color. So in this example, they use orange. Uh, it would be nice to see something like, you know, it'd be great, brown dial with yellow plots on the outside. That would be very exciting. And I think this is also a 34 mil. It's crazy. You can kind of tell the 34 mils from the 36 mils just by the way the cases have been arranged. So it's pretty sweet. Nice to learn about this stuff. OP rhodium is highly underappreciated. Gorgeous in person. The rhodium is the is the grape dial, right, Ron? Um, I don't know if that's the model. I'll just say always perpetual rhodium. <clears throat> is it the grape dial? Oh, no, it's not. It's the gray. Okay, the slate gray. I have, I'm pretty sure I've seen this watch in person. You, you're guaranteed to see these watches in Windows. Um, but I'm not such a fan. I think what I don't appreciate about these 39 mils is the fact that they, they decided to get rid of the loom plots at various points. They really cheapened the watch down to the barest you know, details. When you go so far to get rid of the batons on the dial for, for just three luminous batons, I'm like, hey, now you're really skimping out on us, guys. Give us the full set, you know? Um, I just don't, I don't see it anywhere near as cool as a model that has a full set. Here's the grape dial, which is also exciting. They do make extremely striking dials in this family. And I think the OP shouldn't be a watch that you neglect because it's one of those in, in a very similar way to, to the white dial and the, and the black dial 36, these models could easily be your only Rolex. Even if you're not someone who's into Rolex, I think a color like this really accentuates what you're wearing. Uh, it's very exciting. So, you know, you could be an Omega fan, someone who prefers dress watches, and then you say, okay, today I'm wearing my Rolex. It's not just going to be a black dial Rolex. It's going to be grape dial. I mean, who the hell wears a grape dial watch? Immediately striking. Very, very interesting. I, enjoy, I really enjoy this line. Once again, I'll do a discussion all about the Oyster Perpetual. Rolex Leopard, crappy luxury. Ugh. Okay, we can look at that now. Um, Founder Times Capital, it really is. Watch, watches, I mean, uh, the worst thing is when you write about them practically every day. And, uh, and you learn so much and you gain such a respect. I, I find when I'm writing about these things all the time, you, uh, leopard, you, uh, you get into the shoes and really experience these watches in a different way. And you, you develop some kind of attachment to them especially when you're singing their praises about various things. Um, the Daytona Leopard has to be one of the best watches ever made of all time. Okay. Air King Domino's Pizza. That is a laugh. Okay, we can pull that up just now. And there was a mention about Air King. What do I think? Um, oh, the new Air King. Asad, I think it's a very well-known fact that the Air King is pretty much, especially the latest version. It was, and for anyone who doesn't know, uh, maybe they'll give me the reference here. Don't be vintage, please. Give me the modern one. Uh, what they did, it's it's obvious. The the two one four two seven Explorer that we just saw on the screen, as it was transitioning from these these white gold plots to uh, loom filled plots, they had to use them somewhere. So they decided, hey, let's just put an Air King dial on the watch. It's very peculiar. Um, I've done a video on this as well. I think I called it the unsung hero. Why the Air King is the unsung hero of Rolex. I mean, this watch was made for RAF pilots back in the day. It's quite a commemorative thing. And over time, this watch has just faded into obscurity. And the thing that defines it now is this strange format. I made one modification to the styling of this watch. I don't understand. Let's get a full, full image of this piece and show you. What is wrong with the dial on this piece? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think, and then I'll answer. Notice the numerals around the dial, 5, 10, 20, 25, 35. You notice that everything from 10 onwards, two numerals. Why then would you not incorporate a 0, 5 here to complete this dial? Look at the space between the 55 and the 5. It's like, what were you thinking, man? They weren't thinking. It's just uh, peculiar. A 0, 5 makes it look so clean, actually integrated. So I'll just leave this, uh, this now flawed-looking monstrosity on the page. <laughs> okay. So yeah, very good, very good question, Assad. I mean, I think it's a well-known fact now that the Air King was pretty much made just to sell off the remaining white gold elements of the, the original Explorer 39 mil. So Mark P says, can you imagine being in a conference room talking about circa 200 people on Rolex watches without a script for two plus hours and keep people entertained? 
Yeah, Mark, I don't know how I do it. I've had a few people say, just what's wrong with you? How is it possible that you that you manage to do it? And uh, I really don't know. I don't know what it is. Whenever you have a passion on something, you can you know, find, you can dig deep. And uh, I guess that's that's what happens. I love doing it because it's almost like a time when I don't have to sit down and, and write it on paper. I can, I can just talk and uh, chat to all of you at once, actually engage and, and read what you say. It's a lot of fun. E46, M3, always breaking down as a perpetual project, T-Town. Yeah, BMWs, I don't know, in general, Mercs and BMWs, you have to find the right car. But of course, you know, M3s, if you're getting a car that, that's always thrashed around, you know, JDM, Japanese imports, even Porsches for the most part, any car that's been thrashed and used, you'll find they, they tend to uh, break down. Subarus, for example, Subarus and Mitsubishis, they're really hard wearing cars, but at the same time, no mechanical object can, can take it. Um, let's see what else is going on here. Once again, I'm jumping onto the, the comments that have my name in it because there's so many comments going on. Uh, lack of the zero five points that ruined the air king for me, she town. Yeah, I, I made the video a long time ago, but I just find it so bizarre that they didn't incorporate a, a zero five here. It's like, why not? Uh, it looks so lopsided now. Anyway, it's it's very pedantic, but I think when you're spending that much money on a watch, I've kind yeah, I don't know if it broke the internet when I mentioned it, but just look at that five and that 55 and how out of balance it is. It's a simple fix. I don't know how anyone didn't see that. But again, hindsight, you never know. They, were just, they might have just wanted to push it out. These Air Kings are also very exciting. I think they're great. Okay. Um, ben, thank you for the chat, man. Thank you for the comment. Uh, love Ryan Gosling's vintage Air King. Yeah, he does. And there's some, there's some great people over, over the years. Like if I wanted to talk about Patek Philippe, we would reference Charlie Sheen. That guy knew about these watches way before the, the John Mayers and all these guys that came onto the scene. Charlie Sheen with Patek Philippe, I mean, he rocks them. He's worn everything from, from Nautilus to uh, all of these references. Crazy story about how he got one of them stolen. A very rare diamond, oh, beautiful. Uh, one, of the, one of the first perpetual calendar chronographs. Um, okay, passions are like lusts, completely irrational. You just kill and you'd kill over them. Yeah, it's true, absolutely. You can talk ad nauseum. <laughs> yeah, I would. I mean, I'm just impressed that you guys can actually sit and listen to this for so long. Uh, I don't know what it is, uh, honestly. And I'll I'll tell you this now. Let's just jump to the Daytona Leopard and just talk about something that's completely out of this world. I think of it as the Robert Plant Led Zeppelin watch. Um, I sometimes watch rewatch my streams. Talk about modesty, and uh, I enjoy. Sometimes I get lost in the fact that it's me talking on the other end. And sometimes I enjoy the discussions too. I, it's weird. The way I've always arranged this channel, as I've said, I wanted to make the videos relatable and what I would want to see. That's always been something that I wanted to cover. So if I'm a watch enthusiast, what would I want to see? I want to see more focused discussions on certain models. And in a similar way, these streams let me expand that and just verbal diarrhea. <laughs> okay, uh, what else is going on here? Whiskey helps. No, whiskey and coffee. That's my. That's like my Red Bull. I'll tell you, slightly hammered, but then full overdrive with caffeine. It's fantastic. Cheetown with the salmon dial air king. Let's pull that up now. So the Leopard Daytona. What were they thinking, man? I think this watch came out in two thousand and four. Uh, the colors are strange, bizarre, orange, diamonds. I mean, what else can you say? It's just gaudy. Uh, I don't know how many people it appeals to, but it is rare. It's sought after. It's one of those, one of those models that uh, stuck around. Okay, let's have a look at. If I pull up, Oyster Perpetual. No, it's not. A, it's not Oyster Perpetual. It's the Air King Salmon Dial. Yeah, I dig it. It's a very strange color, though. It's not. Um, it's not as salmon. You know, it would be so much nicer. I have a feeling that the salmon dial would be so much more interesting if it was flat instead of uh, sunburst. I think it, it loses something about being this this hue, the fact that it works on the light like this. Um, salmon dial watches in general are so appealing because you just, it's, it's very understated and subtle. This is a good example. 
if the watch looked like this as a flat tone, I mean, it's interesting, hey? it's like brown and all sorts of colors, it's great. Uh, great suggestion, Cheetown. We've been now going for 120 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. I bet a hooker stole it. Yeah, that's, yeah, flip and zipper. I'm pretty sure that was the case. The watch was like 170 grand that went. And I know I've deviated away, third penalty. If I had to down the brown stuff I'm drinking, I would probably choke to death. I'm sure you guys would love to hear that. Um, okay, catching up with all of you guys. This has been good. Hey, we've African warlord, Mr. Marcus. Absolutely. This is the kind of watch that Idi Amin would probably wear. Or uh, boss, boss Robert Mugabe, or Jacob Zuma, <laughs> all those guys. Uh, it's just it's horrendous. They weren't thinking absolutely, Mister C. Thank you for the super chat, Mister C. I love I love your uh, your comments and everything else. I've seen you before on other channels. I think it's awesome. Love your love your profile picture as well. One of the best scenes in movie history. Um, I never understood the hype. I haven't watched. Uh... <sighs> Damn it! What's the name of the film? I've just, I've just, just slipped my mind. That scene I thought was so impactful, and I was like, okay, where's the big, where's the big turnout? And then he just goes on a tangent. You know, your father stuck this up his ass for for years. It was so funny. I love it. Mark Zuckerberg, Daytona. Okay, can you invite Don Haynes as a guest, Chip Wong? I think Don Haynes would probably crucify me. Again, Don Haynes is a movement junkie. He knows his stuff about movements. I am definitely not in that. I always stick to the aesthetics camp. Um, and what I'm going to do is pull up the live five again. This is what I do every stream. Uh, it's something new I've introduced where bring on a series of references that are relatable to the page, might have inspired me to talk. And I think I'll end, for those of you who didn't join in the beginning, I will highlight a little bit more about what's made these watches so interesting over the years. Why are they globally appealing? It's because they've remained simple all the way through. They've kept to their design language. Even with the doubters, with the people who aren't interested, they really stick to their guns. They have faith in what they produce. And that really says something about any company. Like I, I listed a whole group of names, Levi's Jeans, Ray-Bans, uh, Porsche 911, VW Beetle, Fender Stratocaster. You don't need to uh, think about, you don't need to actually see the image to understand the object in a similar way to Rolex. You mention the name and you get all of these references in mind. And uh, though they look pretty similar, very similar, that's a part of their aesthetic. And that's why they become so popular, so famous. Um, such a cohesive collection, Mr. Marcus says. And that is, that is superb. I mean, that, that really does sum it up. That sums it up better than what I was saying. Again, ad lib talking. Sometimes I miss things. Tanki, uh, Tanku is saying uh, the 116600. We discussed that earlier. Awesome piece. Love the Sea Dweller. I should have actually put the Sea Dweller in the case of uh, instead of putting on the standard Submariner. Um, the fact that their language is so cohesive has to be one of the most cohesive languages of any watch family. Uh, of course, other names incorporate their own stylistic traits. But there's something about this family. What I wanted to do was give it some kind of even spread where we could look from uh, some, some models with numerals, Daytona, Explorer 2. This is a nice five watch collection. And the reason why I made them all black is just so that you could see the, the layouts a little bit easier, see just what they've done in places. So it's really cool. Rolex design, we could chat about it for hours. We really could. And we can stick on this for like another 15, 20 minutes. Um, let me think of another cool watch we could pull up. What's another cool reference? It's amazing that I've been talking all this time. Um, let's see. So you're an expert on the outsides, <laughs> Mason. Yeah, I am. I, mean, I, would, I would say that outsides is where I sit. Uh, insides, not so much. Uh, most things in life, you know? Why can't I zoom out of this now? Hold on a sec. So where could we jump? Chocolate Dial Daytona. We've chatted about everything. Let's just jump to the sea dweller. So again, I'll re-emphasize my prediction. I feel like we'll be getting a rose gold Submariner or something really strange at Basel World this year. Um, just a crazy conjecture. Um, let's see what else is going on here. Mr. Lord Chat. Hey, this is good. For a change, there's not much debate going on here. So I get to like sit back and enjoy the show. 6542 LLD. Nice to have you here, by the way. I haven't seen you. 
I think you've just joined recently. Apologies again for the screen going white. I really don't know why it does that. Uh, 6542 GMT is one of those references, just, just absolutely beautiful. Wouldn't it be nice if Rolex reintroduced a white dial GMT? That would be so exciting. Yachtmaster 42, great suggestion. Great suggestion. Yachtmaster 2, get out, please. The 42, I think, was a great selection from the family. I'm actually, I'm actually really impressed with this reference. Um, because we know Rolex is very keen to stick with their 40 millimeter variants. They bump up to 43. Um, but the 42 in this size and styling, really cool. We might find that the Submariner gets a facelift. I mean, the Submariner might go to 42. I think many people will be quite bleak about that. But they did a great job with this. Great suggestion. Who was it who suggested this? I think I missed it. Yeah, pilot, pilot style. Thank you. Um, so ben, ben says, I'm so happy that really no Rolex watch catches my attention. And this saved me a lot of money for other watches. So another thing I really appreciate is the fact that you can hate the brand and not be interested in the watches, but still join in. Um, I had a feeling that this would be a polarizing discussion tonight because it's only dedicated to Rolex pieces. And I really just wanted to do it for the broader community, people who are interested in the design. Uh, I hope some, hope some of you got something out of this at least. Um, anyway, jumping back to this. I think they did a great job with this, the, the layout, the size. Everything is in proportion, very much like the 43 mil Sea Dweller. They did a great job. Really cool. And jumping back to the GMT, oh, Bakelite. Bakelite is a terrible material. <laughs> Look at this. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, next week's video, Tuesday, we're going to be talking all about patina and faux patina. And I define what patina is. It's pretty funny. I found some pretty useless definitions on the word should be a lot of fun talk about how companies are incorporating it now into their models and later on in the week talking about moser h moser and c streamliner i'm a jack of all trade master of none but outside and inside all watch to be i think but another thing is what i wanted to do on this page was to hone in on opinion and i think everyone has an opinion on everything and it's important to share it not just say I like it I hate it it's good to give a reason why what about it speaks to you with every reference and uh, it, it starts uh, getting you to think a little bit more outside the generic terms that everyone seems to follow which is I don't like it because Joe soap says the size is wrong or I don't like it because Joe soap says the bezel is wrong when you can say I don't like it because coin edging doesn't speak to me much or the size doesn't work for me personally. I also don't like the color scheme for X, Y, Z reasons. It's great. Uh, it helps broaden our thoughts. Wristwatch experience, thank you for joining. I'm sure I've missed a lot of other chats and a lot of you guys have, uh, have gone. Uh, but it's cool having you here. Uh, Cheetown's saying, I, I, I think you're right. Rolex never released the sub and ever rose before. They, they debuted the ceramic Smurf for the first time. And that's it. I mean... We really don't know what to predict. It's it's so hard to uh, think about what they're going to do because they're so unpredictable in that sense. Uh, Amin, thank you so much. I don't know if you're still here, but thank you so much for the super chat, man. Um, great discussion. You know, it was cool. It was nice to change the pace a little bit and talk about something else. I know it's a polarizing subject that I'm sure many people probably aren't interested in, but next week we'll get back into it. We can talk about more open-ended terms as always. I'll think up a crazy subject as always and just riff as usual. Uh, there's a message from, from Dylan saying the 12633 STLRO. What is that? Let's have a look at that now. Fotina disgusts me, Pilot Style says. And I think it has its place. I, I give a very down the line thought about what it does. Stylistically, it, is this a date just? And there was a BLR, STLRO. What is that? Uh, is this the reference here? I don't know. When, when I see those numerals, I, those numbers behind it, I think it has some kind of color scheme behind it. Uh, the Datejust is really slick. Uh, the Datejust 2, I'm actually going to cover a bit in the next write-up. Uh, there's lots, uh, lots of little bits and pieces. There's a question about Cheetown, French press coffee or Italian? I'm more of a French press kind of guy. Um, love it. Love to get into my coffee as well. 
The thing is, when you're in the design field, everyone like loves Nespresso because that's just it's so industrial and cool. But you know, um, just catching up with everyone else. Fotina, <laughs> Fotina is like pre pre ripped jeans. Cheetan, that's exactly what I said in the video. Uh, I was just riffing, and I said the best the best way I could describe it was jeans that have been worn in already. And I also asked the question, will it remain fashionable? You pretty much hit the nail on the head as to how the video, did you help prepare the video? <laughs> oh, it's funny. Um, discuss Buckley dials. So yeah, I mean, I the first time I heard about Buckley dials was uh, Theo and Harris. And apparently it was a famous collector, Buckley, who decided to, to coin the term and he was big on these pieces. I think they're stunning. They give you that that Cartier sort of effect. This one doesn't have a Cyclops. Very interesting point, by the way, on Cyclops models. Uh, the, the, the SD43, did I just get rid of it? I did. c Duella 43 without a Cyclops looks very peculiar. I'm actually going to pull one up right now and see if I can get one. This blew my mind. You won't believe what they did, and now I understand why they added a Cyclops to the to the piece. This is very interesting. If you've just joined, uh, I think you're going to find this quite hilarious. <sighs> Here we go. What they did, the reason why they incorporated the Cyclops lens was not, was not actually to appease the audience. It was because the proportions, oh no, they didn't actually arrange the, the movement to fit a 43 mil case. Because of that, they had to do something to hide the fact that the date is so offset. How is that? I mean, I think I need to do a redo of the video to highlight that point. They didn't think about the size of the, of the scale of the watch. They decided, you know, being Rolex, quite lazy in a sense. They just threw the, the standard movement into a 43 mil case. And the, the result is that you have so much vacant space that they needed to take it up with a Cyclops lens. Um, it's, it's crazy. I'd love to do a recap and follow that back. The other day I was thinking about it and I was like, so why exactly didn't they did they do it in the first place? Stumbled across this, I'll tell you, Rolex forums, you learn so much stuff. Once again, I'll just pull it up for you to have a look at. Check that bat on, on at the nine and see where it is relative to the date. Unreal. Makes sense now, Thomas Bernard. I blew me away. Look at that. Look how offset it is. Bizarre. That was quite a game changer. Um, do like the size. I like the proportions and what they've done. We were talking about sea dwellers earlier, and this last ceramic reference, 116600, the, the final ceramic hurrah is just awesome. I think it's too cool. Uh, one of the most collectible sea dwellers out there at the moment, and for good reason, absolutely beautiful. So certain watches do suit Fotina, others don't, Mason. I think they do. They, there's certain pieces that do have an appeal. What it does, I, I don't want to I don't want to uh, deviate from the video, but what I, I emphasize is that the Fotina has a good way of being able to allow you to separate your eye away from the brightness of a steel case. It allows you to easily see the numerals and the plots at a glance. That's something to cover. There's lots of little things. Um, I think on the, on the Amiga reissues, there are some great ones, but other references, I go through everything. I discuss Tudor, Longines, Oris. Uh, I think those are the four mainly, and Omega. Anyway, so... Pretty cool, 15400 Chip Wong. Are we talking about the date complication being offset? It's crazy. It, how some of these brands are uh, are um, incorporating this, you know, just being lazy for the most part. Anyway, this is great. Uh, I don't have any more suggestions. Subliminal Ghost Rider, that's funny, g -town. You hit the nail on the head. So with regards to the, the Buckley dial, peculiar. Um, I th very classical. What I do like is the, the arrangement, the fact that it's all circular and that it, it sits in that same plane. Um, you know, but again, with Romans, it's all about spacing. And we see the one and the five being very vacant on the dial. I don't know. I do like the Watchmakers 4. I know a lot of people don't seem to enjoy Watchmakers 4. And if you don't know what the Watchmakers 4 is, if you had to draw a triangle from the crown of the name all the way to the eight marker across to the four, if you had to squint your eyes, you would see that there is a relationship 
between the two. They take up the same amount of visual presence on the dial. And uh, interesting trait, not, not correct theoretically, but interesting styling, stylistic choice. Jeez, we've we had a good chat tonight, everyone. So I think what I'm going to do, everyone's calling it a night. I think I will also have called it a night. We've been doing this now for two hours, 15 minutes. It's been a lot of fun. What should I do for a final? Okay, I'm going to pick out one suggestion from you relating to, okay. <laughs> uh, one more suggestion of a reference to look at, whether it's modern, vintage, and uh, we, can, we can browse through that for a second before the stream ends. It's been great though. It's been nice and concise. For a change, I haven't had to like stretch my brain muscles, um, but it's just cool. Always, it's always a pleasure chatting about these references with you and uh, just sharing thoughts on subjects. I think the Yacht Master 2 has done really, really well. Um, just the thought behind the size and the proportions and everything else. It's a stunning piece. So any more suggestions? If you would like to uh, tag me one more time and give me Smith's Everest Expedition, that would be cool. Um, once again, I want to try and stick. Matthew, welcome. For, thank you for joining. It's, it's great. Everyone was actually here. It's nice that uh, you can join in and just sit and chill. And uh, ah, it's cool. I always dig it. 653 at Submariner. Okay, I'm going to stick to that. Uh, I'm Tippy, I'm not going to stick to Smiths tonight. Since we're ending on Rolex, we might as well end on that. But Smiths, I'm doing a write up on Smiths. The Pearl Master. Oh, Doc. Doc, you're killing me, Doc. <laughs> I can't do the Pearl Master. That is just. It's just the most peculiar thing. Uh, it's it's just a glorified date just for the most part with the strangest looking case and bracelet and everything else. Thomas Burnett, you're such a legend, man. I sent you an email earlier. It was very abbreviated, um, but it was such a pleasure looking at your collection this week. I had such a great time and I'd love to do more collection reviews. If anyone would like me to discuss their watches, uh, give them suggestions or pieces that they would like in their collection, it would be a lot of fun. Stockholm publishes <laughs> May Brew digging. Nice, nice to have you here. Welcome. Um, someone, anyone start a live stream after this? Flippin'. Are you telling me that I'm the only one doing live stream this evening? Anyway, talking about the 6538, Paul Newman, Rolex Paul Newman from Pilot Style. Hey, let's do that. Okay, let's do a few references. We'll pull up this. We'll pull up Paul Newman Daytona. I didn't even chat about the Daytona tonight. It's pretty bad. I wanted to go into more detail about just the way they've arranged the subdials on these references over the years. This is the best picture of the model. Um, I think what the, what the Daytona has for it, this reference especially, is that subtlety, understatedness. It's amazing. The fact that it's been able to withstand the test of time and, and uh, work. But again, there's so many other references that can be just as exciting. Uh, you have... Hoyas, you have Breitlings, you have so many models within this family that offer so much more for what you're paying. I, I mean, I wouldn't suggest a watch like this for someone who has all the money in the world to spend. There's a lot more opportunity for other pieces out there. Great suggestion, by the way. Thanks for that. Um, Found the time this couple says, keep going. Yeah, I'm, I'm fading fast, gents. Uh, but it has been a lot of fun. Like, uh, let's end with the Rolex 2508. You know, Thomas is a moderator. Uh, Thomas is such a legend. <laughs> so I have some of the guys hanging out in the back. So uh, let's end with the 6538. I think that would be cool just to end the show off. The 6538 is really that characteristic, enigmatic submariner that everyone knows and loves. And one thing that I think should be emphasized a lot more that isn't mentioned, let's get a nice big high res picture up. Uh, where's a good example? is that these watches were transitioning into that sports Rolex era. So there was no understanding about what size and what, you know, what would be relevant for the wrist. So the fact that they kept it at 38 mils, it really is a dressy sports watch. They built the whole the Submariner aesthetic around being a watch to be used day-to-day uh, -day with a suit, but also as a functional instrument in the water. Awesome story. I think the 50 Fathoms, tips it in a few places because it's it's just all the more rugged and, and built for that that military aesthetic great story though i love it more of that whiskey thomas says that's funny uh a384 or paul newman i would go for a384 any day tippy i mean i think we both know that answer 
uh, it's just beautiful. You can't ever go wrong with Zenith, especially the original El Primero. So, all-time favorite sub, LLD says. He's not a sub guy. This is not a 6538, though, is it? You see, the thing is, that is, when they, when they had transitioned, they really didn't know what they were doing with, with regards to keeping things the same. Some had red bezels, some had big crowns, small crowns, white hand. Some were chronometer certified, others weren't. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just awesome. It's been a great stream. We've discussed a lot. And the time really has flown. When, when a presenter can actually sit for two and a half hours and talk and not feel like it's been this extended time, yeah, it's been insane. Um, so I think that can be it. We've been discussing this for now two hours, 20 minutes. I'm going to stop sharing the screen and just chat to you for the next few minutes before everyone else logs off for the evening. I can see we're, we're losing subscribers like, like flies here. <laughs> Followers, sorry, guys watching the show. Um, so between the 6204 and the 6538, I think we're talking about references. Oh, it's too cool. So what I plan on doing now, this is the main reason why I did this show tonight on Rolex specifically, is because I won't be discussing Rolex for a while, uh, for at least another two weeks. Um, because I'm going to be looking at all sorts of other references, uh, Omega, uh, what else? Omega, talking about Patina, talking about Moza. Um, I also want to do another talk about something specific, not uh, directed at Rolex yet. Of course, live streams, we can sort of jump in and in and around Rolex, but it would be nice to broaden the horizons and deviate in a few places. Um, Rolex given way. <laughs> oh, geez. Black Bay 58. I could actually discuss Tudor in a, in a new video. That should also be cool. We've got a long list of stuff. And... Uh, yeah, it's, it's been cool. I really like the idea of honing in on a certain brand. And I think not next week, but the week after, we can do a Lunga only stream and just talk about Lunga, all their pieces. I'm by no means a, a movement expert, but it'll be just fun discussing the ridiculousness and the beauty of what they've been able to do. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun. So everyone, I would like to thank you all uh, about so for joining. I see a question. How about a stream about your opinion on brands with the best watch movements? Well, Pete, I'm one of those guys that definitely isn't a watch movement junkie. I am so much more focused on the aesthetical side of things. I know the basics, but uh, it would be nice to to broaden my horizons as the years go by. I've only been in this hobby for, you know, five years or so, and uh, really trying to bring that design element to the forefront as much as possible. That's been my my aim. Um, is Glass Hutter included with Lunga? Yes, Tippy, we could easily. I think Lunga, Lunga and Glasuta would be a good pairing. That'd be so much fun. I think it would get a lot of attention. It'd be great. Uh, just going off the beaten track and talking about the sheer beauty. Please chat about the 1815 Sparkles. Sparkles, what a name. I could talk about the 1815 all day. I love that line, what they've done, whether it's the up-down, whether it's the, the chronograph. There are so many references in in between. Anyway. So that's it, Doc Bats. That was the idea. Officially let people have their fill of Rolex, get sick of it. Now we can talk about something else for the next two weeks. So that should be exciting. Uh, but everyone, once again, all 120 of you still watching, thank you all so much for joining. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's always great being able to chat to you all. And, uh, you know, I, I love the fact that we get to sit down and just ramble, ramble on. I don't know how how convenient the chat was tonight if you managed to get anything from it. But, you know, design is a, is a fickle thing. And, uh, you know, anyway, final time is capital city. It's time to take his son for an evening walk around Paris. Have a superb walk. Must be amazing. I'd love to see this, the streets. It would be, be excellent to go and visit Paris sometime very soon. Um, but, again, thank you all so much for joining. I hope you have a superb evening, superb weekend, wherever you are in the world. And uh, see you in the next one. And new content. Tuesday and Thursday, as always. Cheers for now.